I'll just share my screen. So thank you all for joining us for the the second uh, session of what is the uh, Sign Up Centre Education Series. And today we're focused on preschool children and the development um, of this age group, looking at them in terms of behaviour, but also in underlying health needs and development. Um, so looking at the structure of the day, I thought I would give a brief intro uh, once again to the Sign Up Centre if you didn't manage to make the first meeting um, to get, talk about what the centre is about, and what we're hoping to achieve and how we're hoping to link in with our partners in health, but also in education and in social care and in local academic institutions. And I think that's the purpose of these sessions, really. And looking at the list of people who are here, there's a real variety of um, people coming from different areas um, of education and health, which is really good to see. So I'll talk a little bit about Sign Up Centre and then I will. The main bodies of the talk will be through Alex, uh, who's uh, uh, one of our clinical academic research practitioners, um, just started at the beginning of January, who's a speech and language therapist by training and is going to talk about uh, universal strategies for social communication and language difficulties in this age group, uh, followed by Andrea, who's her occupational therapy equivalent within our team, uh, both of whom are targeted and focused both from a research perspective and but also therapeutics about making a real early difference in both of these areas across the region. And then uh, Dr Mosley is going to talk about trauma and its impact on development in early years. It ties in quite nicely with the last session where Annie Swaddingpoll delivered a really good talk talking about the evolutionary psychiatry and kind of uh, links to brain development and, and trauma and early, 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 early trauma. Um, so looking forward to her talk and then followed up is uh, Dr uh, Pascal um, uh, Vitrica, who is from the University of Essex uh, and is going to talk about a really interesting um, new area of, uh, uh, of research called biobehavioral synchrony and how to, I suppose, ob ob objectively measure um, caregivers' um, relationships with, with children, um, which uh, he's going to talk at 3.30. So that's the background for the day, and the focus is, as I said, is on preschool children. Within our clinical service here, we're seeing an increasing number of children who are um, behind in their development for a number of different reasons. Um, one, I would say the numbers of children with developmental problems is increasing from a genetic perspective, genetic diversity. Um, obviously, there are social environmental factors. There is obviously COVID that's happened over the last few years. Um, but undoubtedly, we're seeing uh, an increased number of children uh, entering our service that have more than one, one developmental area of delay, not just in speech and language, but also in emotional development um, and it's putting a great deal of strain on medical services, but also within social care and education, because a lot of these school, these children, I would say, aren't school ready. So they're either being held down in nursery or they're entering school um, requiring a, far, a, a high level of need, which is putting a great deal of stress um, and burden on education generally. Um, so the purpose of today is to think why that is but also importantly, trying to um, how to how to manage this moving forward and have have an effect, an impact. And I'd say probably the earlier we intervene, looking at looking at published research, the better. And I think we found that with some of the interventions we've tried within our clinical service. One of those being PACT, which is uh, preschool autism uh, communication training, which is evidence based and um, research through University of Manchester which is looking at um, uh, parent and caregiver relationships with the children uh, and building on, um, I suppose, by behavioural synchrony in a, way, in a way. So in terms of our clinical service, we were starting to try and tap in to earlier interventions like that, even before a diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental disorder such as autism. So it's trying to be preemptive, trying to be synchronous across uh, a, a range of different areas, health, education and social care, um, and trying to look at what's, what is, what is going to have the biggest impact in what is a quite an under-researched and under-resourced under area. Um, 
So that's kind of the ethos of the of the startup center in a way. It's it's translating research into uh, having the bit the, the the most of impact we can on on children with developmental delays. Um, I encourage you all to look at our website if you haven't looked already. We are recently starting two quite interesting research projects. One is um, called Family, which is looking at the gut uh, biodiversity in children with autism. Um, we have just started recruiting for it and we're looking for 10 children and an age match sibling um, from the ages of three to 10. And we're looking at stool samples and looking at microbial diversity, which I might talk about in the next session and how that might link to behaviour, gastrointestinal symptoms, sleep and all the other things that challenge children with um, some children on the autistic spectrum. And then the second uh, research area which we're starting is looking at um, a project called NeuralNet, which is uh, one of, we're one of the three sites in the UK, which is looking at genetic diversity and cerebral palsy, looking at whole genome sequencing and how that many children maybe with an umbrella diagnosis such as cerebral palsy uh, actually have something else, but we just don't know, that might be more amenable to treatment or more targeted therapy. So it's bringing in more an idea of personalised care, personalised biological intervention. Um, OK, so that's kind of a brief intro to Sign Up Centre in the session today. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass you over to Alex Wilmore, who has jetted in from southern Spain to give this talk today. Pass you over to Alex. Thank you for the introduction. I actually live in sunny Essex. I just happened to be in Spain for the last week and was very almost stuck there and unable to come today. Um, but I did make it back very, very late this morning. So if I stop talking and seem to not know what I'm talking about, I promise most of the time I actually do. Um, <laughs> it's just lack of sleep today. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, my presentation. which hopefully you can see. So um, I've got another presentation just to the side of me with notes on. So if I'm looking between between screens, that's why. So um, as Ben has already introduced, my name is Alex. My current job title is that I am a clinical academic research practitioner working for ESNEFT. Um, so I thought that it might be helpful to just give you a little bit of an introduction as to what my clinical background has looked like so far. Um, so I have been a speech and language therapist for eight years and um, coming up nine when I first came out of university I started working in a special needs school for an independent company that had a big caseload of children with autism but also took children with other diagnoses as well so learning difficulties and um, various syndromes um, but they did have to have a degree of learning difficulty or disability to go to that school so lots of things that come along with that so challenging behavior mental health difficulties I also saw as well but they were all diagnosed with having a learning disability um, after that I started working back for the NHS and my primary role was um, it was called an additionality contract so it was working in mainstream schools and um, topping up the NHS offer so I might be, do some additional one-to-one -one with children and I also had a preschool complex needs caseload so that was children who might have not ended up seeing um, a consultant community paediatrician yet so they might come to us because their speech and language was delayed um, but they may go on to get a diagnosis of autism and the the majority of children that sat on that caseload that was the case for whereas that has changed a little bit now just because of wait times because I think that the wait for speech and language therapy is longer than the wait for an appointment with a community paediatrician so that seems to have changed a little bit. Um, in 2017 I started working in the diagnostic team within Culture Hospital and soon after Ben joined that team as well. So Ben and I have been working together for quite a few years, but the role that I had in Culture to Hospital was purely a diagnostic role. Um, ben did mention at the start of the in, um, in the introduction about um, PACT, which is Preschool Autism Communication Therapy, um, which we did a pilot trial in, in COVID, and that was kind of the only bit of intervention that I did within that role. Um, and I have now started this academic role, which is a 50-50 split, so half research and half clinical. Um, and I do also do some work in the private sector as well but that is mainly for autism diagnoses 
so I hope that just to give you a bit of an insight about what the presentation will cover. So I'm going to speak very briefly about language development and to have um, and hopefully give you a bit of an idea about how language can be impacted by various um, difficulties and kind of the order at which you'd expect language to develop in it develop in and models for that. Um, we'll touch on the link between language and social communication and also the diagnostic criteria for autism. But the bulk of the presentation will be about various intervention strategies that are used to support expressive and receptive language and communication for preschool children. So um, this infographic here is to is to give um, an insight into what language development looks like. So lots of people refer to this as a build as the building blocks for understanding language. So um, lots of people think that this is the order at which language develops, but that isn't necessarily the case. It's just kind of to show you all the key um, factors for that. So looking at this pyramid I don't want you to think that you need to kind of establish the skills at the bottom of the pyramid before moving up because that isn't the case but there, there is obviously some um some truth behind that if you like because it's really important to develop attention skills so looking and listening eye contact um and interaction skills that are learned through play so these foundation skills before moving up the py pyramid because if we're really working on pronunciation skills so how to produce specific sounds um, then obviously it's important that a child can look at your face to kind of know where you're expecting them to place articulators and things like that so it's also just to give a bit of an insight at the start of the presentation about the wide range of skills that speech and language um, roles work on. So I remember when I was training to be a speech and language therapist, lots of people got that confused with someone that might work on elo elocution and things like that. So focusing just on the very tip of the pyramid. So this also shows that comprehension and understanding does start to develop before um, talking so this is receptive language skills shown as understanding so the third block up and expressive language skills is the fourth so comprehension does start to develop before expressive language skills and tends to stay that way for the majority of the production of, of development sorry um, but there is also um, pronunciation skills that start very early so even if we think about like cooing and repetitive babble those you'd expect very early in typical development um, but when we're thinking about key sections of vocabulary and key words often a child wanted to hear that word sort of 10 15 times in context before they're then able to use it effectively the only time that that might not be the case and obviously the synapse center does have a focus on neurodevelopmental conditions is if we see something like stereotype language or echolalia in children with autism they wouldn't necessarily understand that phrase or the words that they were using if they were used in that stereotypical manner um, the other thing to mention is that we speak a lot about children's speech and language skills that are delayed and there are some areas of language that may develop and, and speech that may develop much later than you think. So realistically, if we're thinking about the sound, so a TH um, and with all sounds, there's a voice and a voiceless equivalent. So in a word, it might sound more like a v, like a v sound um, you wouldn't expect those necessarily to be fully developed and be used accurately all of the time until a child was between eight and eight and a half so there are lots of areas of speech and language that do continue to develop into childhood and even if we're thinking about us as adults there might be times where you you read something in a paragraph of text and you're able to give a, an educated guess on what that word might mean but it might be something that you've not heard before but the context gives you the understanding for that um so this is another model for um, language development. So it was developed to help assess children with moderate learning difficulties. And at the end of the presentation, I've included all the references for this so you can have a look at it. And it won a Steinberg Award for Clinical Innovation in 2006 because it shows receptive and expressive skills broken down into 11 core areas. And, and the idea is that you would plot the child's ability based on a one to 10 scale. So it just, um, as um, in comparison, sorry, to their language development pyramid that I've just shown you, this gives you more of an ability to kind of plot development and show which areas of development are typical and which are where they should be compared to those that are delayed. And it gives lots more depth to language development. And because if we think about concepts, so that would be things like big, little, colours, um, that isn't that isn't demonstrated in the previous um, infographic that I showed you.
So there's lots of debate within the speech and language therapy world and Royal College as to which is the most um, useful tool. Obviously, the pyramid is very basic and this is slightly more complex, but they both do have a place in kind of showing how multifaceted communication can be. So um, just to touch on how to identify speech, language and communication needs. So a lot of the work that I've done um, has been at a preschool level and, and um, entering school age. And so a lot of the tools that I'm going to speak about and the interventions are based on children who are kind of between two and six. Um, but these tools are used in primary schools as well. Um, lots of nurseries and schools locally use specific screening tools, so things like Welcome, uh, Talk Boost, and the EYFS framework for preschools to kind of plot um, children's specific communication skills. Also, we have our health visitor colleagues that complete the ages and stages questionnaire with parents, which gives a general um, overview of where language might be. Um, there are some government programmes, so I've included links that you can have a look at them um, rather than me talking about them in depth. But this, the aim for this piece of literature was to in, um, improve speech, language and communication skills in the early years. So there's a specific tool on there called the Early Language Identification Measure. And then there's an interv intervention tool for children um, that are between two and a half and uh, sorry, two and two and a half. And the idea of, of lots of um, these programmes, so Welcome, Talk Boost and the um, early measure, early language in identification measure, is that it helps you kind of plot a baseline for trained staff, but not necessarily kind of tier um, two, like speech and language therapist or specialist staff. So you complete a baseline assessment. It will give you some idea of the child's language development as an overview and then give you so welcome, for example, says if the child scores this in this area, then you should start at this worksheet and it gives you some worksheets to work through. And obviously these kind of tools are really important, even if a child is known to speech and language therapy, because as I touched on at the start, the wait for specialist services, so community paediatrics and speech and language therapy is quite long. And what we find anecdotally is that sometimes when families and children come through to specialist services, they haven't tried a lot of things at home before and actually some of the children that we see may really benefit from these more universal strategies um, and targeted strategies that preschools and families can put in place before they they access a specialist service. So the other thing that I've, I've kind of briefly touched on is more formal and targeted assessments with specialists. So obviously at the point that a child was referred through to speech and language therapy, they're likely to have an assessment. With this particular cohort of children that we're talking about today, it's likely that the assessment is going to be an informal assessment. So that might be through use of observations and play, um, giving some basic instructions, asking the child some basic questions um, to get an idea of what their language um, is. And I mention around formal and informal assessments because sometimes people um, get a bit hung up on age equivalents and you can only really give an age equivalent outcome of a speech and language assessment if a formal assessment is completed but lots of formal assessments in speech and language therapy take kind of 45 minutes to 60 minutes to complete in full and because they're standardized assessments you can't give an age equivalent or standard scores or percentile ranks or anything like that unless the whole assessment is completed so lots of the um, reports that you might see from a speech and language therapist for these cohorts of children are going to be based on informal assessment and also one of the biggest areas that's impacted in lots of these children is their attention and listening skills. So actually, if they don't have the ability to focus and listen and pay attention to the instruction that you're giving, then you can't assess whether they understand it or not, because it may be that their attention skills are so delayed that they're not able to focus on the instruction as opposed to them actually not understanding it. So I have spoken a little bit about the link between language and social commu communication already. And these are just things to think about, really. So um, when we think about autism and social communication, there are some areas that are likely to be more affected than others. So um, if we had a nonverbal child with autism, then obviously a lot of their 
the areas that I spoke about in the language development pyramid and the other infographic that I showed are likely to be affected. However, if you have a verbal child with autism, it's likely that less of those areas are going to be affected. So some, some aspects of communication can be taught, but I just wanted to at this point give reference to the fact that there is um, a lot of debate going on, particularly within the autistic community, about how much we expect um, neurodivergent people to kind of um, fit in with the neurotypical world so how many of these skills are actually necessary so if a child's communication skills are functional and effective does it really matter if they're not able to look at you or if they're in a setting where they can initiate to get their needs met so they're able to ask for a drink they're able to ask to go to the toilet if they and they and they seem quite happy does it really matter that they're not able to initiate to tell their teacher what they did at the weekend or to tell the teacher that there's a dog the other side of the fence um in the um, diagnostic criteria, one of the other areas that we would expect to be affected is a child's ability to converse. Obviously, this is more relevant for children that are verbal and so have, have the verbal skills to do that. Um, but it's also just worth touching on that when um, I was working within the role that I was doing within uh, preschool complex needs, there is a really clear difference between being verbal and being social and I just wanted to touch on that so how to be social without language so if you think about a typically developing baby they have lots of skills that they're able to show other people that they're interested in them and they are showing some early social communication skills so that might be things like looking at a parent or a caregiver smiling pointing using joint attention so using their eyes to point to something that's interesting to them and then look back at the parent to direct their attention to that um, and also using gesture so sometimes if you meet children with severe kind of speech difficulties but actually their understanding is really good and they have good social communication skills they'll do everything they can to get you to understand if you don't understand what they're saying so they might take take adults by the hand and point to things and use gestures to try and describe what they're saying or try and use another word to do it whereas you wouldn't necessarily expect to see that level of effort um, within a child with autism. The other thing that I've mentioned a couple of times is around functional communication. So the basis of this really is thinking about is the child able to get their needs met um, within a setting and, and do they seem as though they are fulfilled and happy and all of those things because as, as a speech and language therapist, um, I think historically there was a lot of, if, if we think back to like kind of 50 years ago, a lot of a speech and language therapist was, role was kind of working on pronunciation skills and teaching the children how to talk, whereas the profession has moved on a lot in that time, particularly when we think about autism and what is important and all children do need a functional expressive communication system so whether that's using words pictures symbols objects signs um all of those things as long as a child is able to get their needs met within a setting then we would consider them to have functional language whether that might be verbal or non-verbal and i'm going to touch on towards the end of the presentation some ways that their skills can be augmented so um, I'm not responsible for some of the um, infographics that I've put in, um, but they are all referenced at the end. So this um, gives an insight around prevention and intervention and kind of five years ago, there was a lot of prevention and intervention work going on, particularly within Essex, thinking about the work that was done in children's centres and the kind of all of the different communication groups that were going on, like as part of Kadu and that were run by Bernardo's and things like that. And I don't know whether um, it's just that they're not as well um, advertised anymore or whether there isn't as many happening but like I touched on um, a while ago we are seeing lots of parents and families that come through that haven't really accessed any of the kind of universal strategies that can help benefit so they kind of go to their GP or speak to their health visitor about concerns with speech and language and then come straight to a speech and language therapist or a community paediatrician whereas kind of five years ago there was lots of work being done in children's centres and you'd you'd meet families who have said oh, I've been attending a group for eight weeks and haven't and it hasn't really made the impact that I was expecting 
that I was expecting it to make and things like that that doesn't seem to be happening as much anymore but I would say that um have, since having started this started this role I've done a lot of networking with different professionals um all based within Essex and it does sound like there is a lot of services that are on offer so part of the role and um at what Andrew and I are considering is that if there are all of these things on offer then why are they not having the impact that we would expect them to have and what their uptake is like so at the start of my presentation obviously the title mentions around universal and targeted strategies so this is really just to demonstrate that so universal strategies are, are strategies that every child can benefit from so it is another pyramid but it basically takes into account things that all children um, are able to access so whether they've got communication um speech language needs or not um, so that would be things like completing the screening that I mentioned so welcome and talk booth doing training for whole schools and preschools and thinking about how we can facilitate communication friendly environments which I'm going to touch on a bit later um, then we have a targeted level of support so this um, just shows that around six, uh, 50 percent sorry of children start school with a speech language and communication need so this might be um, children where they've had a speech and language assessment and the speech and language therapist has recommended that they join a, a group sorry to work on um, particular areas of language they might um, give some additional recommendation on the environment that the child's in so how to incorporate signs symbols and visuals um, and be there to give guidance on it so if, if a child was to start a group and they weren't kind of progressing as the speech and language therapist would expect how that group can be altered and amended to make sure that that is having the best possible impact then at the top of the pyramid we've got um the children that require specialist support and the aim of this pyramid is to show that actually this also is showing the number of children so really it is the fewest number of children that we would expect to need specialist support so that would be with a, um, a speech and language therapist or other kind of therapists like aba but for the purpose of communication it would be a speech and language therapist so having an additional and specialist TA trained in the setting or a key worker in in particular type of interventions but also still being dependent on a speech and language therapist to be able to prioritize the children within a setting and plan particular um particular groups and and plan specifically what interventions those children need and i've just included this to show you because i think that there is um if you're from Essex you might be aware of the better communication work that's happening at the minute so there's a mapping process looking at the service offer that's available and it's just thinking about how there is a lot of um, focus on making sure that all children are having um, equal opportunities and, and getting the same service but we just need to have a think about equity because we want all children to have a similar outcome at the point that they start school or go into school with a similar level of skill in speech language and communication as opposed to um, giving all children the same service offer regardless of their difficulties and then that kind of keeps them um, their skills um, in different like in different areas and at different stages of development and one of um, as Ben mentioned so Andrew and I are doing a master's and in some of the reading that I've, I've recently done for my research proposal I read a piece of research that said that there if you do a, a screening on development on children at five years old their level of speech language and communication is generally reflective of their overall development so taking into account gross and fine motor skills taking into account social communication taking into account their learning level all of those kinds of things and it was something like 80 percent of people stayed within the same banding for those skills until um, if they were rescreened at the age of 45 so just thinking about how going into school with the speech language and communication need especially if you're a child who developmentally is way behind can impact your whole life in terms of quality of life employment opportunities mental health and um, all of those things so we do have to be considerate and um, keep our priorities around giving different levels of input to make sure that all children are see um, are achieving equitable outcomes particularly when we're thinking about the transition from preschool to school so um 
the like I said at the start, the bulk of the presentation is around universal strategies. Um, so some of these are, are can be used universally, and some of them are also used in a targeted way as well, dependent on how preschools implement those into their settings. So I've got five that I've identified that I think it would be useful to speak about in a bit more depth today, because from my experience, they're the ones that I use the most. So intensive interaction, attention, autism, uh, visuals, objects of reference, and keyword levels. So intensive interaction is a um, an approach for helping people with learning disabilities or autism who may be at the early stages of development. So if we think back to the language development pyramid that I showed at the start, it would be people who um, would benefit from having an intervention that focuses really on um, those skills at the bottom of the pyramid. So looking and listening, play. Um, and kind of moving up the pyramid. So it develops and teaches fundamentals of communication. So understanding and using eye contact, facial expressions, vocalizations that may or may not lead to speech, taking turns. Um, and this is an intervention that really is not focused on kind of the person being able to speak at the end of it. So it's based on how parents interact with babies in their first year of life. So if you think about if you were observing a typical interaction between a parent and a baby, so kind of a baby might coo and a parent would copy that back, lots of kind of exaggerated facial expressions. And really, even though babies, typically developing babies aren't using words or phrases or sentences, just thinking about how it's possible to have a reciprocal interaction at, at that early developmental stage, that is what this intervention is based on. So it's really implement implementable, if that's a word, um, in uh, the majority of settings, actually, because it's not something that you need um, any equipment for. You need specific training in. Um, you just need a sensitive person, which can be a child or an adult, but most of the times it's an adult. And you're working on developing and building relaxed sequences. So for this particular intervention, enjoyment is the main motivation. So it's play based um, and vocalisation can be considered a target, but speech definitely isn't. And sessions can vary dependent on what the child's been up to that morning. Are they tired? How motivated are they to interact? Do they just want to spend some time on their own? Some sessions may be really loud and some might be silent, but the level of volume, if you like, isn't necessarily um, doesn't determine how successful that session was. So it's focus, um, It's the fundamentals of communication are rehearsed in a relaxed setting. So it would prim they, these intervention sessions would be primarily in a setting that the child's really comfortable in, which might be a preschool or nursery or their home environment with a person that they're familiar with that's receptive to very subtle signs of communication. So it's non-directive and responsive. So what that means is that it's not about um, kind of saying, oh, can you roll the ball to me? Can you play with this? Can you do that? It's it's more about watching and waiting, um, enjoying, taking turns and, and allowing the child to lead lead those interactions. Um, so adults might imitate, they might join in, they might sit back and watch. There are lots lots of um, fundamentals of intensive interaction that form the early stages of PACT, which is the intervention that Ben's spoken about today. And it's really just getting people to be more mindful of how a child at this level of development would communicate. So if they look at something, is there a meaning behind that? If they smile at you, what is that telling you? Um, so the learner, so that in, in, this, in the situations that I've used it in, there's a preschool child really leads in direct directs that session and adults follow which does definitely take some practice to um, get used to and kind of become familiar with. So the next um, intervention that I'm going to speak about is attention autism and this is an intervention where if you are delivering it and you're directing people on delivering it you should attend attention autism training so this is just a really brief overview today um, so there are four main stages to attention autism Gina Davies is the person who um, designed this intervention and she does have a website but because you need to go on the train and there isn't a great deal of information on the website um, the aims I've put just here for you. Um, I'm not going to read them out. But again, at this stage, because we're thinking about preschool children a lot of the time, really, we want children to enjoy those se those sessions, because if the motivation and the engagement isn't there from the child, then the, the interventions are going to be really difficult to deliver, because a lot of the time, 
we might see children whose attention span is genuinely 30 seconds so how can we keep them engaged for a bit longer and the principles around attention autism are by using the most motivating things that you can have that, that are in your setting so something that the child really loves and it's just too irresistible to look away or to leave that session now, a typical attention autism session when you're working on stage one, so that's the bucket to focus attention and I've got a picture of what might be in an attention autism bucket, but really you're kind of thinking about 90 seconds at the start of this. So you might have three objects within your bucket at the start and the adult would, um, it's a group intervention, so an adult would be sitting and then you've got a circle of children around. I have only ever done this in a special needs school and when I was working in a special needs school, lots of the children were one to one. So they did have um, kind of six children and five adults and then the adult leading. So they sit in a group setting. You've got the adults around and you sing an introductory song um, saying, I've got something in my bucket. The adult that was leading lifts the lid of the bucket off, looks inside and they act like it's the most exciting thing they've ever seen in, in their whole life. And all of the adults are expected to do the same. So if the child was to switch their attention for one minute to someone else around the room, everyone else is looking at the bucket. So we're also developing joint attention skills because it kind of teaches children to focus back on what everyone else is looking at. When the adults looking in the bucket, they then pull one object out of the bucket. And the idea is that it would be quite an exciting toy so this frog you squeeze it and its eyes pop out of its head or you've got the chattering teeth or something that makes a funny noise and then the adult would activate that toy pop it back in the bucket and pull that out for two more objects and it's a daily intervention it shouldn't take any more than like I said 90 seconds for three objects but then as as the children's attention span is increasing you're able to add more objects into the bucket and make that session a little bit longer um Stage two is an attention builder. So it's important just to say that with all of the stages of, of um, the attention autism program, you start from, you still do stage one and two. So if you move on to stage one, you still start your attention autism session with the bucket and then you move on to the attention builder. So that might be um, something that's really engaging and appealing. Often lots of these activities are quite visual. So it's still presented to the group by the adult. I and mean, then it's to sustain concentration and attention for a longer period. So things that I used to do within this stage of the attention autism program was something like if you had a plastic bottle and you put a piece of gauze over the end blowing bubbles out of the end of a plastic bottle or you might have um, water balloons that were filled with paint that you dropped from a height onto a piece of paper so that they splashed and made a pattern on a program uh, sorry a, a pattern on a piece of paper um and then stage three, there's lots of similarities between stage two, but the idea is that there are some children within that group, not every child, but there are some children within that group that would get a turn at that activity. So if you did the one with the water balloons and paint, it might be that you picked three children who got to come up and drop one of the balloons onto the piece of paper and then they'd go and sit back down. This um, teaches children how to shift their attention between different people so obviously the child that didn't have a turn would be expected to focus their attention on the adult who started the bucket the adult who then had a turn and then three different children and it also teaches skills around sharing the fact that you might not always get a turn um, and being able to wait and then the last stage within within the attention autism program is an individual activity so you'd have your stage one bucket you'd have your stage two activity which then some children would get a turn at in stage three and then for stage four you'd have an individual activity where children left the group setting to go and have a turn so the adult would demonstrate this first and it might be a really simple creative task so they might be given a piece of paper with three circles on it and then you might have three potatoes with paint that they stamp into each of the circles and then bring their piece of paper back to the group at the end and the children focus their attention in a group switch their attention to have um a turn in an individual activity and then return to the group to show their completed tasks. So this also helps their um, and develops their skills to shift attention, build independence and follow some simple instructions. The focus at this stage isn't on kind of understanding verbal instructions because the language level throughout this task should be really low. So the adult is not saying you pick up your potato and you stamp it inside each of the circles. The adult's just demonstrating that chart task and then the child's expected to copy that dependent on the level of need you have within a setting obviously um, determines how many adults you'd need to support an activity like this as well because if you've got one adult running the group and then five children whose attention's all quite poor and you've got four of them running off at the same time it's going to be really difficult to kind of get through this program so in in lots of the settings that this is primarily used it's where there's a lot of adult support.
Um, so I'm going to speak about objects of reference, but I really quickly just wanted to speak about symbolic understanding. So the reason that this is important when we think about communication is because a lot of the time when um, I've gone into settings before um, and asked kind of what they're doing to help children understand what's happening, I think that symbols are kind of what is used most universally in a lot of the settings that I've been into and this is kind of showing how our symbolic understanding develops you've got the most concrete which is a real object so this would be if I was holding a real apple through to the most abstract which is a written um, version of whatever that object is so this is really important because when we think about um, if we're going to implement visuals within a setting whether that's symbols or whether that's actual objects how do you know if the child understands that so if you start using a symbol to tell the child that it's that it's snack time do we are we sure that that child understands the symbol or do they need an object to support that transition to snack and how you then expect information back so if a child is not able to understand a symbol then something that uses symbols to communicate like if we're thinking about PECS the picture exchange communication system um, then that isn't likely to be effective so it's really important to have an understanding of where a child's symbolic understanding is um, and the most simple way to do this is to have real objects and doing a matching task so if I had um, an apple a spoon and a and a toy pig and I took pictures of those exact objects, can a child match the object to the picture? And then I might try it again and have the real objects. And then um, they've got line drawings, or then I might have the real objects and symbols. And if a child is able to match them, then you have a fair understanding that they're able to understand whatever you're matching them to. So if there was a spoon and the word written of a spoon, if they can match it, then the chances are that they can read and understand that the word spoon means the same as an actual object you might hold. So it's really important to know that a child understands objects before we implement objects of reference into a into a setting. So objects of reference are basically um, children and people learning about um, what objects are, what they might represent and how they help a child understand and express um, whatever they want whatever you want them to or whatever they want to. So objects of reference is a whole physical object or part of an object that has a representation to a certain thing. So this might be, it represents a person, an object, a place or an activity. Um, so you can also use objects of reference in the same way, progressing through the symbolic under, uh, the development of symbolic understanding so you might start supporting transitions with objects and then as the child's symbolic understanding continues to develop then you might thinking about using think about using a photo instead so as an example if a lot of um in my experience a lot of the challenging behavior that i used to see within people um within the special needs school that i worked in was at periods of transition so quite often the teacher would say something like okay we're going to go on the bus and go swimming now um and they might have a symbol of the swimming pool to show that it was time to go swimming but if you don't understand words and you don't understand symbols and then you're carted off out of your classroom and put into a bus and you have no idea where where you're going when you're coming home are you going to be back from school in time for your mum to pick you up are you moving house there so it's really just to communicate around transitions and that's what I have found objects of reference to be most useful for in my work so it might be something like implementing having a set of objects that you use to um, represent various transitions you might have a toilet roll that's used to go to the toilet a pair of goggles that you use to go swimming so you show the child the goggles and would say swimming and then pop them on the bus the child might hold the objects for the time that they transition and then you might have a different object to show them that it was time to come back to school um, so like for example a key and um, if they need a key to get into their classroom all those kinds of things I've just got here being mindful of rigidity and how objects of reference are being used. So we know that people with autism um, do have some rigid behaviours. So the, just thinking about the toilet roll example that I used, if you're using a toilet roll, it needs to be the same every time. So if you're going to use an empty toilet roll, use an empty toilet roll the whole time. If you're going to use a full toilet roll, use a full toilet roll the whole time rather than just getting one out of the toilet, especially for people with visual impairment that it might feel a little bit different. So if you've got a toilet roll that's this thick or this thick, how confusing that could be if they think that it might mean something else. And the main kind of take home message about objects of reference is that consistency is key here. So you need to be consistent with the objects that you're using. Um, 
in my experience, it isn't particularly used expressively. So these these are primarily used to help children's understanding um, around transitions, mainly like I've spoken about, but they can be used expressively as well. So I have seen children in classrooms that when they need the toilet, go over and get the toilet roll and show that to the adult. Um, but they are mainly used to um, help children's understanding. So um, keyword, understanding of keywords is helpful for um, when we're considering expressive and receptive language skills. So these are just some instructions that you might hear when you speak into a preschool child. Um, so can you point to the um, big black cat's eyes, make the lady jump on the bed, find me a banana or an orange. And um, the main thing to consider at this point is how you're giving the instructions. So for example, if you have a banana, an orange and an apple, and you're saying to the child, can you find me the banana and the orange? And you look at the banana when you say banana, and you look at the orange when you say orange, the child doesn't really need to understand any of that instruction at all to be successful so if you're trying to test the child's understanding or you're confidently saying or oh, the child understands when I give them two instructions at a time just being mindful of the other cues that you're giving them so I've just um, shown here in these particular um, examples that I've given you've got a two a three and a four keyword instruction but only if there is a choice for each of those objects so like I mentioned with the banana and the orange if I had just had a banana and an orange and there was no third object the child wouldn't need to understand that at all they would just give me the two objects that they have and I've just shown um shown this a little bit further here so if I was to say make the lady jump on the bed obviously for lady there's a choice of lady man and child and there's a choice of bed chair and table so at this if these were the objects that I was presenting a child with they would have to understand three key levels however if I gave the same instruction and said can you make the lady jump on the bed but there was only a lady and there was only a bed all the child would need to understand is jump because there's only two objects there that they can use so I know that I am running out of time. So just briefly to whiz through some strategies for expressive communication. So being considerate as well of keywords, which we've just spoken about, and I'm not going to go into any more detail about this when we're thinking about expressive language. So modeling and labeling. Um, and the reason that's got as above is because if it, if you know that a child understands two keyword levels, you always want to push them a little bit further. So you would then model and scaffold back at a three keyword level. So in that situation, you might have a child that's saying lady bed, lady bed when they're making the lady jump on the bed. And you would model back. Yes, the lady is jumping on the bed and really kind of emphasize that keyword that would be missing from their vocalizations. So AAC, alternative and augmentative communication, which is how we can augment a child's ability to communicate using other means. Colourful semantics and word aware are some other named expressive um, language programmes. So colourful semantics really gives visuals um, and teaches the most important aspects to a sentence. So there are four key stages to this, and there are further stages that incorporate more complex sentences, but in the majority of situations where this approach is used, it's used at this level. So it can be in spoken and written work, and you have visuals and sentence strips, and it's often used alongside other um, interventions particularly if we're thinking about communication books and pecs and things like that the child might have a sentence strip that looks like the strip on the presentation here where they're expected to move symbols down i'm going to talk next about um alternative and augmentative communication and I'll come back to colourful semantics a little bit more. So AAC is a range of strategies and tools that helps people struggle with speech, which might be as simple as something like a letter or a picture board to more sophisticated communicate computer based systems. And they help someone to communicate as effectively as possible in as many situations as possible. So it's broken down into three um three uh, types, if you like. So no tech, low tech and high tech. So no tech means that it doesn't need batteries um, and there's no extra equipment. So this would be things like um, using a point, using gestures, using eye contact, vocalisation, signing, things like that. Low tech communication systems also don't need batteries, but there would you would need equipment. So it might be things like a yes and no board. So shown down here, it might be an alphabet board um, where 
these would be for children that are able to spell if you wanted them to spell out words or it might be a communication book or something like a PEX book or objects of reference like we've spoken about before. Um, and then you've got high tech system. So this um, picture up here is a screenshot from an app called Prolo Quotago, which is probably one of the most popular um, expressive communication apps and they need batteries or mains power to function. So most gadgets um, produce uh, speech as an output and some are based on mobile devices, tablets, laptop, um, but high tech doesn't always necessarily mean most complex. So for those of you that are familiar with switches, a child might push a switch um, that makes a noise and the aim of that switch is just to get a person's attention or you might have something like this where you can make really long sentences. And the reason that I just wanted to include this screenshot when I was talking about AAC is that you can see that all of the different um, symbols are different colours of backgrounds and when I was working with children using Prolo Quota Go I'd make sure that they matched up with the um, with the, the colourful semantics that I've just shown you so I would put every um, subject so every person in in orange so I and then you'd have all of the other children's names in their class perhaps you put the verbs in yellow to show that that what the person is doing would be would need to be a yellow so that it matches up and you can use a variety of systems together um, and then that is basically it. I think I'm actually a little bit over time and I thought I was going to be under. So I don't know if we've got time for questions now or if we'll need to come back at the end. But that was just a bit of a, a whiz through there. Um, and I've put I, my email address is there, but I'm also included in the email invite. If anyone wanted to email me after the presentation with any questions they have or want any extra information on anything I've spoken about today. Great. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um... I'll take questions so you can either message them in the box or if you put your hand, maybe maybe write them in the message um, box if you have any any questions for Alex. Maybe I can, if I just say something briefly, I didn't actually introduce myself at the start. I assumed, I suppose this is the second one. Um, so uh, if I just share. And then. See my slides. So I'm um, a, a paediatric consultant uh, and director for the sign up centre. I also work within the wider ICB as paediatric lead and for the BACD. And this kind of what Alex was talking about and what the other talk speakers will discuss is the increased need in children in our area with additional needs who are under the age of five. And certainly in the, every year I've worked clinically for ESNEFT, the numbers of children referred into our CADU service, so our early years autism assessment service, um, this seems, number seems to go up every year. So these are children with significant um, delays in their development, not only in speech and language. Um, and I'd say from, from a personal perspective, from learning about development through my son Fred, who you can see here, he was now nearly nine. Um, he's nonverbal with a diagnosis of autism. And just from our journey from understanding his communication, um, not all communication is verbal and communicates in many different ways, but you have to certainly he needs the child needs to want to communicate, be given the opportunity to, but really importantly, be in the right environment. And one of Fred's biggest challenges, which links on to Alex and um, Andrea's talk, is if a child feels scared or vulnerable through sensory processing problems such as noise sensitivity, they won't want to communicate. And the other thing I found from living with Fred for, for eight years is his perception of the world is very different from our, our own. So he sees, he hears the world in a very different way, um, which I still don't really understand. So a lot of these ch complex children, to try and understand what their lived experience is like is very, very tough. And not, don't always assume that a child can see what you can see or hear what you can see or hear because it's all very different. But the biggest thing I would say is is the enjoyment of the interaction. And I'm sure that's what Pascal will come on to talk about um, and Beth. It's the enjoyment of being with that person that you're communicating with. It's and that it's such an important part of of developmental progress, but also that development can be static. And it can be regressive, which is very frustrating for the child, but also for the person trying to teach that child to develop. We always assume that children would develop 
once they've got something, that's it, we're going to move on. And that's certainly not the case. And if I had the answer as to why that is, um, we may be in a different place than we are now, but that's certainly a really common thing I see in more severe autism as well, profound autism. Any questions from anyone for, for Alex before we move on to Andrea? No. I've just so seen that Davina popped in the chat really quickly around the talk together groups and that yeah. that was kind of um I think so Ben Andrea and I met with Lizzie Kingsford last week and spoke about lots of the things that are on offer um and we know there is lots lots of things that are on offer to families but a lot of the children and families that we see haven't attended those or yeah. aren't aware of them so it's just really for us to try and find out why that isn't happening and why the message isn't getting across to parents which which we are working on. Davina, did you want to come say anything for them? Do you mind? I I just I've I've had face to face experience with mums. I used to run it when it was called Chatterpillars and we did mm. Outland training to run that. And the um the, these these families are very hard to reach because parents know that if they bring their children, like you said, Alex, 30 seconds concentration and then they, they want to go off. And so therefore they feel people are going to judge them, they feel embarrassed. So these groups need to be run um, with that sort of understanding and sympathy and it's very challenging and we used to have six to eight children and their parents in a group and it, and it's a very challenging environment and when you are um, I mean my manager was very very supportive she said if you only have one person in the group we still will run it but at the moment we have a reduction in spaces because of finances and we also have have just come through COVID where all the groups went to um, online sort of tuition, which was quite tricky. So, but yeah, I'm hoping that it will come back again more strongly and more regularly because we do need that for our under fives. Okay. Um, so you. I'm just, thank you very much, Davina, for making that comment. Um, any other comments before we move on? Um, I think we yeah we we can share our slides. Whoever put that in, I also as a last point I'd say less is probably more. Um, and a lot of parents that we see and families are eager to push on and go beyond maybe the what the child can, can, can what the level the child is at. So I we I've certainly been guilty of that. Um, and to try and get the foundations in place. And again, it's the enjoyment of interacting and mm. and the shared enjoyment, uh, shared attention. And realising we all communicate in different ways as well, which Alex alluded to earlier for neurodiverse children. Um, so moving on to Andrea. Um, so I won't um, uh, go into her talk, but in terms of from a parental perspective, sensory processing is such an integral part in, in happiness of children and their ability to learn. And I think we certainly this is an area which we have, it, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg really in terms of uh, how this is impacting on children's learning and, and happiness within within preschools. So I'll pass you over to Andrea now. Thank you, Ben. I'm trying to share my slide. Bear with me if you can see that okay. Can you turn your volume up, please? I don't know that I can, Ben. Um, I don't think I've got an option to turn up. Is Can you not hear me very well? If you go a bit closer to the screen, we can hear yeah, you better. I can try. I was oh. going to apologise before I start. I have um, got quite a sore throat and sniffles and a cough and things, so that might be why you can't hear me very clearly. So I apologise to begin with. Um, if it isn't loud enough, I'll tell me and I'll try and shout a little bit louder, if that's OK. Um, can you hear me reasonably well for now? Yes. Yeah, OK, thank you. Thanks. And everyone can see the slides OK? Yeah, OK, good. And so my name's Andrea. I'm an occupational therapist and I'm also an advanced sensory integration practitioner. And I work alongside Alex, who is our previous speaker under the sign up centre at Esneth in North East Essex with Ben as well. And I'm working in another one of the newly developed roles as clinical academic research practitioner. And within that role, my time is split equally between clinical work and research. 
So for a very short background to me, before joining this team, I've worked in a private hospital, I've worked in a special school and also for NHS services in Essex and Suffolk. And I was working with service users from preschool age through to adults. Um, however, my experience is mainly in working with um, children. So my interest in sensory processing and neurodevelopmental conditions has spanned throughout my career as an occupational therapist. And that has been from um, day one of the first day of my job as an OT. And for today's talk, I'll be introducing an overview of the considerations for supporting sensory processing in early years settings. It is quite a big topic, so there is a lot more to it than what I'll cover today, but hopefully this will give a good introduction for you. And so I'll start with a simple introduction to begin with of what sensory processing is for anybody that's unfamiliar. And so sensory processing is the term that's given to the sensing, interpreting and the use of sensory information in order to produce a response. So we're continuously receiving sensory information from the world around us via all of our senses, and that's happening all of the time. And that sensation is detected by sensory receptors that are throughout our body. And the senses provide us with rich information as to the what, where and when of our physical experience. So our brain and body process and integrate the sensory information and it's that processing and integration of that information that enables us to make sense of the world around us and to produce those responses. And it's those responses that really allow us to interact with the world around us um, and with the people in our environment and the objects that we need to, to use and manipulate as well. Um, now a little brief overview of the senses. I've put the eight main senses in here so it's generally accepted that there are eight main categories now the big the full picture is a lot more complex than this and within each sense it's still not fully agreed or fully understood um but these are the main eight categories that you will see that are generally accepted so if i start to begin with with the tactile sense so i'm sure all of you are very familiar with this sense so tactile is our sense of touch and this looks at both discriminative touch, so how we feel the tactile properties of something, and also um, protective touch. So that would be sensing discomfort um, externally, so for example, on the skin. The next four, which I'll bring up quickly for you, you'll be really familiar with as well. So they're auditory, sound, visual, sight, gustatory, which is the term used for taste, and olfactory, the term that's used for smell. Then the next one um, is our proprioceptive sense. Um, so this one is about our body position and force. Um, it allows us to sense where we are. So if I put my arms out to the side, I can feel where they are without looking. It also allows us to both sense force and pressure that's coming towards us and also to grade that pressure and force that we're putting out into the environment as well. Um, so it enables us to do things like um, control our hand when we're writing, know how hard to press on the pen or pencil, and to be able to judge when a ball is coming towards us, how we move our arms to successfully catch that or kick it when we're playing a game. Um, the next one is the vestibular sense. So this one is our movement sense. And this helps us to detect um, movement, it helps with our balance, it helps with our postural control as well. And the sensors for this one lie in the otoliths and the semicircular canals, which are inside the inner ear. And they detect that movement, um, which includes the orientation. Um, and this is only of our head. So if we were to move our limbs, for example, we wouldn't pick that up with our vestibular receptors because they're in our head. But if we tip our head to the sides, we get that sense of where our head is. Um, it also picks up our directionality and also the speed at which we're moving to. Um, and lastly, there we go, is interception. So this one um, is a slightly newer term, and this is what's becoming the more generally accepted term. There are other people that might use slightly different terms. This is the most accepted term for those sensations that are happening inside the body. Um, and by those sensations inside of the body, that would include things like hunger, thirst, bladder and bowel function, internal discomfort. Um, so for example, if you get tummy ache, um, and it also encompasses our ability to feel the physiological manifestations of our emotions. So if you think if we are maybe scared or excited, we might have butterflies in our tummy, we might feel an increase in our heart rate, and we can link that to our emotions to understand that. For children who have difficulties with their interoceptive processing, it's really difficult to make those links between those physiological feelings um, and the emotions that they're feeling as well. <laughs> 
Um, right, so next I'd like to talk you through some of the ways that sensory processing differences might be categorised and how they might present. Um, but before I go through them, I would like to highlight that nobody fits into one box for everything. So you can present, you can have within the same sense in the same person, some under responsive, some over responsive. This can also vary at different days and different times. If somebody's already dysregulated, then they're far more likely to be more affected by these senses and be more um, potentially over responsive to sensation. Um, it's also worth considering that the way that this looks outwardly to other people can be very different to what's happening underneath the surface. So something that I often hear is um, if I assess a child and they're found to be very sensitive to sound, the um, teachers and parents will often ask the question, how come they're often the loudest child in the room? And that is something that does often happen. So it can be quite confusing um, as a bystander to understand what's happening underneath. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the first one we'll look at is over responsivity. So when using this term over responsivity, and sometimes it can be called hyper responsivity or hyper reactivity, we're thinking about children for whom a typical level of sensory input is essentially too much. So the amount of input that we would generally accept throughout the day and would be useful to us for these children is often overwhelming. Um, and they only need a very small amount to register it as well. So a very small amount of input to register it's there and then very little more than that will move into that category of being overwhelming quite often. There's some examples of outward signs of over responsivity that you might see in preschool age children include the ones we've got here on the screen. Um, so we might see children who are withdrawn. They might be upset, agitated, distracted. They might appear to be fearful. We'll often see children who are avoidant or trying to flee, trying to escape or run away from a situation. Um, and it's very often the case that this over responsivity is experienced as being painful. Um, now, some examples are also as well to link on to the, the research there that I've referenced. So there was a recent metasynth uh, metasynthesis by Sibioni et al in 2022. Um, and they found from their um, research that sensory over responsivity is very often experienced as painful. And this is then very often a barrier to being able to engage in activities. So I'd also give some examples of how this might be linked to some of the specific senses. So if we think about the auditory sense, um, a child that becomes distressed when there are loud or unexpected sounds, that's quite often. Um, quite possible that they will be having an oversensitivity to auditory input. And we sometimes might see things as children who put their hands over their ears, and that's a very clear sign to us um, that that is too much. For the tactile sense, we may see a child that becomes withdrawn or upset or agitated if they're asked to participate in activities that involve additional tactile input. So if you think things like messy play, for example, also, situations where a child might be asked to have quite close person to person contact as well can be very difficult for children who are what might be considered to be tactile defensive. That's often a, a term that we hear. And um, for the visual sense, we might see children reacting negatively to bright lights or environments that are really quite visually busy. So lots of things going on or very bright or lots of patterns that can be quite overwhelming. Um, an example I've tried to give, and I don't know if it's worked as well on the screen as I'd have liked it to, um, but the picture in the background there at the top of the slide is of a light glare. Um, so depending on your screen settings for some of you to focus on that and stay looking at that might be quite uncomfortable to do. Um, and this is something that for some children they find with with lighting that we would look at and think that it's normal lighting and it's fine and we can see what we're doing. For some children, that light is actually just too much and they're receiving almost like a glare into their eyes, which is really uncomfortable experience. Um, so you might see children who are um, avoiding certain rooms that might have harsh lighting in. You might see children who are squinting a lot or choosing to wear sunglasses or caps or covering their eyes um, at, at all times of day or at certain times of day. And that can be some signs of this. Um, now, the next one we'll have a look at is um, sensory processing differences, which indicate an under responsivity. Um, so again, these can come alongside the over responsiveness and that does what it's what makes quite a complex picture sometimes. But if we were to look at it as purely under responsivity, when we're thinking about children who might be under responsive to sensory input, we're thinking of those children for whom that typical level of sensory input just isn't enough. 
So it's the opposite to the children who are over responsive. Here, when we're thinking about the threshold that's needed to notice that that sensory stimulation is there, that's really quite high. So these children often need a larger amount or a higher intensity of that sensory input in order to register that it's there and to make sense of it. <clears throat> Um, now, when a child is under responsive to sensory input, we might see one or both of the profiles that I've got on the screen. And I, I've tried to find some pictures that kind of match uh, match what I'm getting at there. Um, so if a child is under responsive, we might see this, um, the one we've got on the left, passive. So we might see children who are taking longer to what might consider to be tuning in. They kind of take a little bit longer to work out what's going on and to tune into what's in their environment. They might require an increase in repetition or in the intensity of that sensation to be offered to them in order for them to register that, that sensation. And these children that we're saying are passive are probably not seeking that for themselves. So they might be quite unaware of what's happening in their environment and they might need an adult or another person to actually offer that increased sensation to them. Um, and some of the things we've got on the screen there um, are, as I've said, taking a long time to register the sensory information. So we might find the children who often are in maybe a little bit of a daydream, it might appear to us, who are often the last ones to realise that everybody's packing up and it's time to get their coat and their bag and move on to the next task. Um, they'll often require those additional prompts and it's often really useful to give those prompts in different formats across the senses. So not just saying the same thing again, maybe giving a visual prompt, maybe a tactile prompt, a, a tap on the shoulder to say to, to get their attention and to help them. Um, also, when trying to do activities, it can be useful to help to move these children. Um, so later on, I talk about things like exploring yoga and similar things with children. Um, and sometimes it's really difficult to get the body into the correct position. And sometimes that tactile element is needed to, to help and to prompt. Um, and these children might also be bumping into others without realising as well or bumping into furniture without realising. Now, the second profile that we might see is the seeking profile. Um, and this includes the behaviours such as we've got on the screen there. So these are children who are likely to be jumping, running, bouncing, climbing and swinging. Obviously, we expect children to do that, but these children will be doing it more than their peers. They might kind of have a stomping manner when they're walking or drag their feet because they're trying to, um, I say trying, it's instinctive, pushing their feet harder into the ground so that they can feel where their sense, uh, sense where their feet are and um, so that they can move effectively. Um, some of these children might be considered what might be called heavy handed. They might be using excessive force when they're doing activities and this that might then result in breaking item, um, items accidentally. And they might play in a rough manner with their peers. And this is often unintentional. They don't realise that they're being too rough to them. That just feels like a normal level of play. These children will also often crave cuddles or squeezes and they will often um, put items in their mouth to chew. And these children will sometimes when they're having a meal or a drink overfill their mouth to get that sensation. Um, now, sometimes these behaviours could be interpreted and I have seen it in some settings and um, that the child is intentionally being careless or they're intentionally misbehaving. However, for these children, they're simply doing what we all do, which is we're following our instincts to try to feel the sensations that we need to make sense of our world. But for these children, those sensory systems um, need that sensation a little bit stronger and for a little bit longer to be able to make sense of it. And the last category of sensory processing differences that we might see is difficulties with discrimination and or praxis. Now, these can and often do sit alongside the modulation challenges that we've just spoken about a moment ago. And when there are challenges with the sensory systems that hinder that ability to successfully discriminate the sensory information, it's incredibly difficult, as you can imagine, to produce an accurate response. So some examples of where um, discrimination challenges might present um, one of these is visual discrimination. So for children who have difficulties with their visual discrimination, they might find it difficult to find a certain toy in the toy box. They're likely to find it really difficult to complete something like a puzzle, to find the piece they're looking for and to fit it in where it needs to go within that picture. Um, and also if you ask them to do a task, like go inside and find your water bottle and bring it back out, in a room full of things that's going to be really difficult for them because there's just so many things and to find that one item they've been sent to find is probably going to take them quite a lot longer than their peers or they might need help to do that and when there are difficulties with tactile and proprioceptive discrimination we quite often see difficulty with dressing and also manipulating fastenings on clothing or shoes 
in this age group that is still a developing skill but it's something that's often evident as children get older that being able to do those things automatically isn't a skill that comes easily so for you and I we can dress ourselves we can do up our buttons our zips we don't need to look at what we're doing we can feel where our hands are where the zip or button is and we can do that just using our tactile and proprioceptive senses for children who have difficulties in those senses, they're likely to need to use their visual sense, for example, to support with that. Look very closely at what they're doing to help as an extra guide um, so they know where to move their arms to manipulate those items. Um, and when there are challenges with tactile, proprioceptive and the vestibular, so the movement sense, we're really likely to see difficulties producing smooth and accurate movements. So some examples on here are things like controlling the pen or pencil, catching or kicking a ball, anything where we need to really coordinate our movements to make contact with another item. Um, so now I'd like to go through, hopefully that's given a little bit of an understanding of some of the challenges that we might have see. And now I'd like to go through some of the things we can do to help. So I'll start with the environmental adaptations. And this list isn't exhaustive. There are probably hundreds of different things that could be done, but these are kind of some of the most common ones and the ones that I've seen have most success. So the first one is creating an environment that's compatible with the sensory needs of the children to support their participation. Um, and that will come in by really looking at that child, seeing what their needs are um, and also a combination of some of the things that follow on the slides that are coming up and some of the points on here and trying to make sure that that environment is really a good fit for that child's needs and to remove anything that might be hindering their ability to participate due to sensory needs. So the first one that um, we'd look at is decreasing clutter, harsh lighting and visually busy areas or displays. Now, um, displays of work, interesting things within um, preschools, nurseries, classrooms are fantastic, but for some children it is just too much. Um, so it's a good idea to have a look at what's there and scale it back as much as possible, not to make it boring, not to make it so it's not interesting, but so that there isn't anything unnecessary, um, particularly if there's areas where the children need to concentrate and focus, there are areas where it's good to have a bit of a declutter. Um, if a child's working at a table, perhaps just have the things that they need to be working with, nothing extra that might get in the way or distract. Um, it's also really useful to create separate zones um, where children can focus. So some examples we've got on here are to consider all of the senses. So think about if you have a, a child that you want to participate in an activity, are they sitting facing a window or a door? Is someone playing a game outside? If there is something interesting happening that might distract them. Um, think about the sounds that are in the environment. Could they be distracting? And are they comfortable where they're sitting? We need children to feel comfortable so that they can take their focus away from that basic need of getting themselves sat in the right position so they can free up some of those cognitive processes to engage. Um, now, creating some low um, stimulation zones or quiet spaces as well. So these spaces would be more of a, a retreat. So for children who are um, easily overwhelmed by their environment, they often really appreciate having somewhere which is low stimulation to go to so that they can kind of reset and re-regulate. So sometimes people use dark dens and I have seen on occasion some of these dark dens filled with lots of flashing lights and toys, which isn't really what we want if it's being used as a, a low stimulation calm space. So what you'd be looking at in these areas is um, some low lighting or a dark space, whichever the child prefers, um, for it to be quiet and for it to have quite a limited number of items in there. If the child has something in particular that helps them to calm and regulate, then, then that's absolutely fine to go in there, but you don't want to fill it with lots of different things. And also having some things in there like some soft furnishings, um, bean bags, pillows, blankets, things to make it nice and comfortable. That can be really helpful as well. Um, another thing to look at in the environment is flexible seating options. So these can be really useful to provide regulating opportunities um, for those children whose nervous systems need that little bit of movement in order to regulate. So I'm sure we've all seen children who find it really difficult to sit still and they often kind of fidget on their chair and swing on their chairs, which sometimes can be quite dangerous for them. There are different seating options and chairs available which actually help to give that input um, while still remaining safe. Um, and also access to regulating sensory supports can be useful for some children. So things like your fidgets, your sensory tools, and these would be um, as appropriate for each child. And lastly, I would just like to touch on predictability 
sorry, predictable environments and predictable expectations as well. So this can make a really significant difference to the processing of sensory information. There's a study in 2013 by Ashburner et al, which heard from autistic young people who experienced sensory processing differences. And one of the key things that they shared was that unexpected sensations are significantly more alarming and are more difficult to tolerate than sensations that are expected expected sorry um so for example if there were to be a fire bell drill that's due to happen if that comes completely out of the blue it's extremely overwhelming um but from the children that were spoken to in this study they said if they were told when it would be happening so they could prepare themselves um then actually that was a lot less distressing for them when it happened and the next bit I'm going to have a look at is the task adaptations. So for children who are sensitive to certain sensations and will find it difficult to process that sensation, there are some adaptations we can make to tasks and activities to make them a lot more accessible. So again, there are a lot more than these, but just a few examples. So for children who are sensitive to tactile sensations, some of the things that you might consider so that they can still engage in the same activity as their peers might include things like providing hand washing stations or wipes. You might provide gloves so that they can still do the activity, but without getting the mess directly onto their hands. Um, and you could do that if it's messy play, art, cooking activities. You could also look at providing the option of, and this sounds contradictory, non-messy, messy play alternatives. So the things that people are using for the messy play, but putting them maybe inside a clear sealable bag. So you kind of paint, glue, um, slime, glitter, whatever it is you might be playing with inside the bag. So they can still have that play with it. They can still make artistic patterns, but actually none of that gets on their hands. Um, and utensils can also be really useful as well. So that use of utensils so that you don't have to actually touch the items. Um, and something else that can sometimes work if it's tolerable for the child is to play with dry textures rather than those wet textures. Now, for children who are overwhelmed by sound or busy environments, some of the things you might consider are offering activities in smaller, quieter groups or on a one to one basis. You might have the child access the activity um, or area either at the beginning or the end of a session when it's naturally quieter or offering some quieter and less busy low stimulation sessions. And for children who have difficulties registering sensory information, it can be really helpful to offer additional prompts across the senses. So I think I mentioned this before, um, that kind of multi-sensory approach to give the child more opportunity to pick up on those prompts and take the action. You might break tasks down into smaller steps, and it's really important here as well to allow that adequate processing time between each stage. So not just processing time for the instruction that might be given, but time to actually process how that sensation is feeling at the time as well. Um, and it's also really useful, as I've already touched on, to limit distractions. Um, so this might mean things like rearranging furniture, for example, um, and some of the other items I spoke about when limiting distractions in the room. Um, now, I'll have a little look at some of the strategies to support regulation. So these are really important. Um, sometimes even more important than the other strategies, but ideally you want to be looking at everything all together as a full package to support a child. Um, but these will make those other strategies a lot more successful as well. So in order for children and for us adults too, to process sensory information, we ideally need to be at what we call a just right level of alertness for a task or activity. And this is also sometimes called um, a calm and alert state. And I have realised I've not labelled it up on the diagram, but it is where the little green arrow is there. Um, so we kind of have our, our high level of alertness, which is not to say that it's never beneficial. Sometimes it is. So if we need to be aware of danger or if we're participating in an activity where we need fast reactions, being at that top level, that really high level of alertness and really taking in everything that's happening around us is actually a really good place to be in those situations. But to be there all of the time is really stressful. Um, there are also times when being at the lower end of the uh, scale of alertness is also beneficial. So on the picture there, that's on the, the blue line at the bottom. So these for times, for example, when we need to relax or when we need to rest, that's where we want to be to be able to kind of shut off and rest in that time. 
but most of the time when we're going about our daily activities it is somewhere in the middle which is in between those two green lines if we want to kind of depict it onto a diagram um, and that's what we'd call our, our just right state or in that middle zone calm and alert so when we're there we're able to attend to a task we're able to focus um, and we can engage and we're not too high and we're not too low we're just right so as adults, we will often automatically and also consciously make adjustments to support us to be in the optimal state of regulation for a task. So, for example, we might have a coffee, we might kind of have a stretch or sit up straight if we want to increase our focus. Or if we want to relax, then we might dim the lights. Um, if you think in the evenings, we put ourselves into comfy clothes, we get into a, a soft bed with a soft duvet and a soft pillow to relax ourselves and bring ourselves down in that level of regulation. And sometimes our children will also instinctively seek out sensory input. So an example of this is sometimes we see children who um, instinctively chew on items. We see children who will rock back and forth, um, children who are seeking movement. And often that is an attempt to try and um, it, it feels nice. So children have done these things and they've realised that when they do that, actually, that makes me feel a little bit better. And they're trying to instinctively seek out that input that they need. Um, but what will quite often happen is that children, particularly when they're younger, will need some adult support to guide them into the strategies that will help maintain the optimal balance. Um, and I've got some of those strategies on the next slide. So these are universal strategies. And on the following slide, I kind of narrow it down a little bit more into some alerting and some calming strategies. On a universal level, um, heavy work is something that comes up a lot. So this is when we're engaging our proprioceptive sense. So those receptors that are in our muscles, spindles and joints that are feeling that pressure and force. When we activate those, that sends some really nice calming and regulating signals through our nervous system um, and really helps to get us into that just right state. Um, some of the things we might do here would involve pushing, pulling, weight bearing, maybe helping to move items. So if you need to set up the, the setting, you need to move some furniture around. If you've got children that need some regulating input, they're ideal children to pick that task. Um, also things like climbing and crawling really activate that sense as well. Regular movement breaks are really important. Um, and as is regular outdoor play in nature. So this has been found in quite a few recent studies and there are more coming out um, that being outside and being in nature has a really positive effect on our emotional well-being, on our regulation and also on our ability to focus as well. Um, and another one that's really useful for a universal approach are yoga and mindfulness. Um, and again, there were quite a few more studies coming out now. It's something that previously there wasn't so much research on, but it is starting to come through and we're seeing these now put, being put into more and more settings. Um, they can be really beneficial the, the kind of the movement and the pace and that slowing down and the breathing really helps to regulate the nervous system. Um, now, looking at this on the basis of calming and alerting, I've tried to put these in a little table because sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish when we're thinking about a particular sense and in a particular moment, what's going to calm and what's going to alert. So these are the, the ones which are typically calming and typically alerting across the senses. Now, with, as with everything, there will always be an exception to the rule but 99% of the time they will be within these categories. So if we think about the tactile sense and we want some calming input, we're thinking about deep pressure touch. So touch that reaches into the deeper layers of the skin. Things like massage. Um, so if you think it for yourselves, if you go for a massage, it's nice and relaxing. I certainly know people that have fallen asleep when they've been having a massage because it really calms and relaxes them, that deeper pressure on the skin. Um, and also things that don't involve that person to person touch. Um, activities such as sitting in a ball pool. So if you're in a ball pool and you've got all those balls, they give lovely pressure. That also is nice and calming for the nervous system or a large bean bag. So one that when you sit on it, it really squidges around your body. That's also a really useful tool to have. And if we think about <clears throat> the tactile sense for alerting, we think about light tickly touch. So I often say to people, if you use your fingertips or your nail on the back of your hand really lightly, even though you're expecting it to happen, if you do that as a really light and gentle touch, it's still quite alerting even when you're expecting it to happen. So any kind of light touch across the skin, if you think about things like a feather going across the skin, that light touch, um, someone brushing past. So some children sometimes find it really uncomfortable because it's too alerting to have someone brush past them gently. Um, and also when we think about things like labels, enclosed, textured clothing that can be quite irritating, that's often over alerting for the nervous system. 
um, for the vestibular sense, so our sense of movement. Some of the things which can be used to help to calm and regulate are slow rhythmical rocking. So if you think about swinging nice and slowly or rocking backwards and forwards or side to side, it does need to be in one direction, ideally, because if you start to move in multiple directions, that becomes alerting. So if you think like when you've got a baby, and you rock them. We have lots of, you know, there's there's rocking cots. We rock babies in our arms because that helps to soothe them and to calm them. And um, that's exactly the same throughout the lifespan. So for children, for adults, that um, rocking motion is still calming and regulating for us. Um, and if we're thinking about alerting for the vestibular sense, we think about multi-directional or fast paced movement. So if we think spinning, jumping, running, all of those things that bring us up and energise us are going to be really alerting. Um, for proprioceptive input, you'll probably notice I haven't put anything in the alerting box. Um, proprioceptive input can help, um, often called organising. It doesn't tend to over alert. So this is a really good, safe one to go to if you're not too sure what to use and you have a child who needs something to help them to, to calm or to regulate. Proprioceptive input is a really good, safe one to go to. So I think I've mentioned these before, some of the examples, so I won't repeat those. Um, but making sure that this movement is slow and controlled and activities with some resistance in them will give that nice proprioceptive input. And it does fit in nicely with things like the yoga that I discussed fits within this category as well. Um, and lastly, I've included the gustatory and oral motor. So if we're thinking about um, using that as a calming activity, we want to be thinking about chewy foods, jewellery, so designated items that are safe and designed to be chewed. Um, and also sucking motion as well. So if you think about drinking through a straw, if you think about when a baby feeds when they're very young, children sucking their thumbs, for example, it's a really calming um, input for the nervous system. So having that as an option for children um, within their classrooms or within their nurseries can be really useful. So when they have a drink, instead of having a cup, have a straw or a sports bottle, it's those little things scattered throughout the day that can really make a difference to maintaining that regulation. Um, and if we're thinking about alerting under this sense, it would be spicy or sour foods, things that are ice cold, so ice cold food or drink, and also crunchy foods can be really alerting as well. Um, now, the next little bit we'll look at is praxis and coordination. So sensory processing covers, well, everything really, to be honest. Your senses give you all of the information that you need um, to be able to engage with your environment um, and exist within the world. So when we think about sensory, so far I've covered mainly the modulation piece, but there's also the praxis piece, which is to do with our coordination and our ability to plan and undertake movements as well. So our practice and coordination, they develop through our experience. Um, so you think about when a baby is born, they haven't yet built those pathways and got those motor skills to know how to walk, how to reach. And they're all things that develop over time. So this does very much develop um, through experience. So providing lots of opportunities for children to move their bodies in novel ways. So new ways, different ways to how they normally move their bodies um, and to challenge their senses in a safe and play based environment is going to really offer those ongoing opportunities to, to continually develop those skills. And some of the ways that you might look to do this um, and that are some of the kind of therapy favourites, if you like, are obstacle courses and animal walks. But I'll, I'll explain a bit in a minute for anyone who's not familiar with animal walks. Um, so these don't need to be limited to just having the adults set up the activity and the child participate. It can be really useful for the child to be involved in setting these up as well and designing them. So the child can help to make the decisions what they'd like in their obstacle course. They can move the items into position, which is going to give them that proprioceptive input. It's also going to involve some planning for them as well. Um, and when it comes to the animal walks, they can be the, the person who gets to choose or demonstrate what people do. So animal walks are very simple. Um, it is as easy as someone either calling out or demonstrating their chosen animal and how it would walk. So, for example, if someone says rabbit or frog, that would involve some form of jumping. You'd normally get down on the ground, maybe on all fours. It may be involve your arms as well and jump across the room. It can be turned into a race. It, it can be anything you like. Um, and for young children, that's really fun. It's really engaging. It's very play based. It's nice if they take it in turns. If they see everyone else's interpretation of how that might work, they'll often make it into a bit of a joke and, and take a funny take on how the animal could walk across the room. Um, but that is a really good way of combining that 
requirement to plan and execute those novel movements that they wouldn't normally do. And it's coupled with that regulating sensory input. And the combination of those is helping to continue to develop that body scheme and that coordination of the movement. Um, now, I've got a couple of case studies as well that I would like to go through just to illustrate for you how these strategies um, have been implemented in practice and some of the outcomes that you can see. Um, so the first one here, and obviously I, I've used pseudonyms, is we'll call him John. So John is a four-year-old male who was diagnosed with ADHD and his referral was due to regular attempts to run around the class and also to run out of the classroom um, and attempt to abscond from the building as well. And the setting had been trying to use a, what you might consider traditional reward chart approach. This wasn't working um, and there weren't any strategies in place to support his regulation. So the intervention consisted of, first of all, that sensory education to the setting to help them understand a little bit what was happening for him, um, why he was doing these things and to describe um, the dis dysregulation that he was likely to be experiencing and the things that could be done to help with that. There were environmental adaptations and these included removing all unnecessary clutter from the walls um, and from the surfaces where he was working, providing flexible seating options and also creating both a movement space and a quiet space, both of which were easily accessible at all times without restriction. Um, task adaptations that were put into place included breaking down activities into manageable steps. Um, he had a vigil um, schedule put into place as well. And he was also completing activities within a smaller group with additional support. And some of the additional regulating strategies that were put in place included regular movement breaks throughout the day. So even if he wasn't instinctively seeking that movement, it was timed into his day to make sure he was receiving that regular movement. Um, and particularly around times of transition as well, which were quite challenging. And this was with a real focus on regulating activities. And this also included the introduction of basic yoga poses for him. And something that really has stayed with me from working with this child, this was in the beginning of um, also trained in special yoga. And this was shortly after I trained in it. Um, and I decided to trial it with this child who could not, um, couldn't find a moment of stillness and, and, and calmness. And he was just constantly on the go and um, and seemed quite unhappy in that as well. So in an introductory session with some of the, the workers from the setting, I introduced him to some, some really simple yoga poses um, and the staff were, were blown away and they commented that they'd never seen him have a moment of stillness before um, and they'd never seen him appear calm. Um, and it really changed the way that they looked at things. So some of the outcomes from this were that his participation in activities actually increased and this was at a level of him showing interest in what was happening within the room and also being able to engage in those activities with short periods of focus. Um, and his attempts to abscond significantly decreased as well. So overall, the underlying change that was seen was that he moved from being in this constant state of dysregulation to being able to spend the majority of his day in a more regulated state. And this in turn then reduced that urge that he had to try and flee from his environment. Um, and let's have one more case study. So this one is, we'll call him Jack. And he was a five year old boy who was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And he was referred due to regular outbursts of anger and aggression, and this included shouting and also throwing, kicking and hitting furniture and objects. It wasn't ever directed to anybody else, but it was directed to objects within the environment. Um, so within the setting, there was very little knowledge of how sensory processing differences can affect regulation. Um, and the approaches that were being used at the time weren't addressing those underlying causes of the dysregulation. So one thing that they were doing is that when he um, misbehaved, not my word, a word that was used, he would not be allowed to participate in football, which was one of his favourite activities. Um, and the, the contradictory nature of that is that actually participating in football was one of the things that was giving him some of that movement that he needed. So it was actually making things worse. Um, it was done with good intentions under kind of a, a traditional behavioural approach whereby you behave and you get to do nice things, but actually without addressing those underlying sensory needs, it was just not working. So for this young man, it was identified that um, some noises in busy environments were sometimes a trigger for him. And it wasn't the case with all sounds at all times. Sometimes he was fine, but there were certain situations, particularly when there were lots of sounds that were overlaying each other, which is something that's quite common. Um, 
also when competing voices were present and when he was exposed to an intensity of this sound for a prolonged period, that would often turn into a trigger. So he could cope with a, a reasonable level of sound and he didn't want to have anything introduced that would the, block the sound. He really wanted to engage in what was happening. He didn't want to use ear defenders or anything that would block out the environment. Um, but there were times when it just got a little bit too much for him. So the intervention that was used in this setting was again that sensory education to the setting and that always comes first and then the environmental adaptation. So in this case, it um, included an audit of the auditory input within the environment, um, looking at how that environment was at different times of the day. Um, creating again a quiet area which was easily accessible and for this young man something he found really useful was to walk or to pace so that really helped him when he felt dysregulated to kind of feel a bit calmer and more regulated and gave him that time away so we also introduced a walking route that he could access um, when he needed to um, which was really helpful for him as well um, and instead of doing something that might have been considered disruptive he was directing it into the agreed route which he was involved um, in deciding what route he wanted to take as well and something else that was done as a task adaptation was using quiet areas for focus activities and working within smaller quieter groups so maybe choosing those children that are the quieter children to be in the group with rather than maybe the louder children for him was something that really helped um, now he had been instinctively trying to seek the regulating proprioceptive input of pressure and force that he needed, he, but he was doing this in what we'd consider to be a maladaptive way. So when he kicked things and threw things um, and hit things, actually that made him feel a bit better, um, but it wasn't the right thing to be doing. So once this was redirected into some proactive activities, so things which actually met that need before it got too much, um, and also that could be used as reactive activities when needed, those incidents of anger and aggression significantly reduced um, and staff also reported that he engaged much more in the activities that were on offer. Um, and as was the same with the previous case study, the change that was seen in this young man um, is that he moved away from often being in a state of dysregulation to being able to spend the majority of his day in a more regulated state, um, which in turn um, reduced that impulse to, um, to seek that pressure and force through those maladaptive behaviours. Um, so that is all for what I've got to, to talk about there to do with sensory um, processing in preschool settings. And I just wanted to touch very quickly if I've got a moment, although I don't think my slide's going to work. Ah, here we are. Um, just on things which are upcoming for me. So first of all, I'll be undertaking a research project under Anglia Ruskin University, which will be designed to highlight the sensory needs in preschool children, um, which parents, carers and early year staff currently feel they're not able to adequately support um, or they don't have the information that they need. And then secondly, leading on from that, I'll be developing an intervention to assist those parents, carers and early years staff to further understand those sensory needs um, and for them to be more equipped to support those needs in the children that they care for. Um, and then there are a few slides, quite a few slides of references, um, and that's me. And uh, if anyone has any questions. Great, thanks, Andrea. That's a great talk. Um, Sylvia Regatta just commented that she's had to let leave, but enjoyed uh, enjoyed both both of your talks. Um, and Simon has put a comment in the box. Very interesting. I've had have a child in nursery uh, who can't who they can't cope with i can give them some of these ideas so it's positive for, for them thinking of uh, ways to to help calm and regulate um any other questions from anyone someone's got the hand up actually uh rebecca rebecca dads yeah sorry i think that was a mistake <laughs> that's why right. anyone oh, else i think there's something from catherine in there the child that was kicking, what did you do to redirect them? You mentioned you redirected them, but I wasn't sure. OK, so it was that um, it was proactive. So putting in proactive strategies that gave that same um, that gave the same input helped to significantly reduce those occasions when it was happening. Um, and then he had a 
a, a selection of activities that he preferred to use. And if he did start going into a moment of one of those activities, he'd be re redirected to something else. So, for example, if he felt like kicking at the time, and particularly because football was an interest for him as well, he would be offered, OK, do you want to have a break? Would you like to go outside and play some football and turned it into a... Um, a nice productive activity rather than something um, that was going to damage property. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, Beth. Yeah, hi. I was just going to say how interesting this is. And I do a lot of work and training for schools, uh, both primary and secondary, around young people and their mental health. And I just think some of the things that you've talked about today would be so valuable for them to know so that when they're seeing young people struggling with regulating themselves, they can really think about the sensory demands for those young people in that environment and then be quite proactive at trying out um, different things to support those young people. Um, so, I yeah, I was just I do a big training program for schools and I was just thinking how amazing and for parents too and our, our parent workshop program was just thinking mm -hmm. about how amazing it would be to put something together even if it was recorded that we could make really tailored for for schools and, and both primary and secondary and also another one potentially for parents because I just think you know there's so many referrals that we're seeing going through for ADHD or ASD assessment at the moment in Suffolk within our NDD pathway and many of the things that you have cited are the biggest problems for young people uh, potentially there could be a sensory intervention that can could immediately provide some support. Yeah there is for Suffolk um, I've just left the team so if you um, do you know Jane Dolan who's one of the service leads and Karina Sewell no. The OT team in Suffolk um, so and my Jane, colleague Jane, Kat okay. Bedwell, yeah, I can send you the details, um, but I was part of producing a, a sensory workshop for schools that's now available online for all schools in Suffolk, so oh, I can, I'll oh, send you the details, yeah. <laughs> fantastic, that sounds great. But I think the, the, the one of the main things in preschool children that I think about is many of these kids are, are completely anxious, really, really anxious, scared, and you can't learn if you're scared and you can't be happy mm -hmm. and I think that just presents as other challenging behavior and also long-term stress and anxiety leads to the mental health issues that Beth has just described yeah. so long-term sense of sense of stress gives you all of these other mental health issues but also physical symptoms so reflux gastrointestinal problems uh, immune problems which all manifest with in, in life of chronic stress and and Annie's talk last week uh, last month talked about why we're seeing so many of these children suddenly uh, with these is issues and not just with autism, but with others, just sensory processing problems and align more to trauma and kind of a fight or flight response, which is imprinted uh, due to due to more maternal factors or environmental stresses, which I think Beth is going to hopefully touch on now with with trauma and the talk you're going to give. Um, so I think that that leads quite nicely on to the next talk, actually, unless anyone else has a has uh, anything else to add? OK, so why don't we move on to Dr. Dr. Beth Mosley? Uh, she's a consultant clinical psychologist and lead psychological therapist um, and lead for Suffolk psychology in schools team in NSFT. She's also the, the SIPLI clinical lead in Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care Board, honorary senior professor at the University of East Anglia and visiting senior fellow in the Integrated Care Academy. And uh, Beth is going to talk about trauma and its impact on development in early years. So thank you for coming, Beth. Thank you. And I'm going to try and squeeze this effectively into 45 minutes because I wanted to cover a few bases. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me here today. And yes, that long list of things makes me sound incredibly important. <laughs> I don't feel like that and also incredibly busy which I, I do feel like um, so really lovely to be here today just you know all of those things are off the back of really uh, the last five years of working in quite a different way into uh, education communities as a psychologist and really um, trying to bring experts psychological support and help to communities at that grassroots level so that they're getting the opportunity to have 
of someone like myself to talk to it, when they're concerned about young people, they're concerned about the culture of their education environment, and we can all think collaboratively together about how can we make a community, a culture which is beneficial for mental health and young people's development and growth and thriving. And a big part of what I would do in that, that job um, in the secondary schools was help make sense of what might be going on for some of the young people who may be presenting in ways which meant they weren't able to access learning. And for many of those young people, they may well have experienced um, some kind of trauma within their childhood. Now, today, the focus is on the sort of pre five. Um, so I'm going to um, kind of try and stay on, on task with that. So just, you know, we're covering trauma, it is an emotive topic. And for all of us, we will have experienced our own traumas throughout our lives. Um, and so sometimes when we talk about trauma in these contexts, um, it can bring an emotional response for us. So really, this is just about giving you permission to look after yourself. If you need to take a break or step away, then please do. First of all, before we get started, we have been concentrating a lot for some brilliant presentations. I thought it would be nice for us to just do a little regulating exercise and actually something to calm our nervous system. It's something we can teach young people and we can do ourselves. We can teach really young people, so under fives, this butterfly hug. And it was lovely to see in that last presentation some of the things around bilateral stimulation, how this might be helpful. So that, what you're going to do is you're just going to cross your arms over your chest, interlock your thumbs, so you've got a bit of a shape of a butterfly. And then just relax yourself a little bit soften or close your eyes whatever feels natural and then if you just do some slow alternate tapping one hand and the other almost like butterfly wings and while you do that try to just kind of breathe quite deeply into your stomach and you might be noticing some thoughts going through your mind you might be noticing sounds you hear my annoying voice um, try and just let those thoughts pass through don't get too hooked up with them and just sort of relax into that feeling. I'm just going to do that for another 30 seconds. So this is something we can teach our young people to do. I'm a great advocate that there's lots of different breathing exercises that we can do with young children that we can teach them. Um, in primary school and, and nursery settings. So I'm trying to work with education and big academy trusts to try and shift the curriculum and put more focus on integrating practices into the school day, which can help teach young people about how to up and down regulate themselves. That just become part of classroom practice um, and really reduce that stigma around struggle. OK, so today what we're going to cover is and for many of you, so you've got to know a lot about this already. So I'm trying to kind of perhaps share some new ideas um, and not cover too much old ground. But first of all, we're going to cover water races. So adverse childhood experiences. We're going to then think about the impact of trauma on brain development and then some practical strategies to support young people who've experienced trauma. So childhood, um, adverse childhood experiences, as we can see here, there are a number of them which are kind of broken into categories of abuse. So that could be physical, emotional or sexual neglect. And again, that could be physical neglect or emotional neglect um, and dysfunction or toxicity within a household. So we may see family members with mental illness. We may see that some a relative is in prison or has has had kind of uh, involvement with the law, um, uh, perhaps domestic violence or experiencing conflict, quite significant conflict within your family, divorce um, and substance misuse. So what the research has shown is that these adverse childhood experiences have a big impact on our development as young people growing up. Now. These um, ACEs are accumulative in their impact in terms of having more exposure to more of those ACEs increases the probability of having more challenges, not just with one's emotional well-being and mental health, but also in terms of the physical um, health going into 
into later life. So around half of um, adults have not experienced any ACEs. And then if we look at the remaining percentage of the population, 23% would have experienced one, 16% two to three, and 9% nine, 9 will have experienced four. And we know that if for young people who, or adults who experienced these adversities within their childhood or adolescence, they are going to be um, four, four or more, they are going to be more likely, three times more likely to have lung disease, 11 times more likely to use or misuse intravenous drugs, four times more likely to have sexual intercourse before 15 or by the age of 15, 14 times more likely to attempt suicide, um, 4.5 times more likely to develop depression and two times more likely to develop liver disease. So this information is really telling us that trauma has a both uh, physiological impact on young people that goes well on into adulthood um, and it also has an impact on our, our young people's mental health again as they go into adulthood. So what is trauma? Um, trauma is something that, as I said at the beginning, that we may we may all experience different sorts of traumas with, in our life. But essentially, it's the experience of something very stressful, frightening or distressing. That could be a one off event or it could be multiple events which may be chronic and ongoing. It can often lead to some form of severe emotional shock. Um, so, for example, being involved in a road accident could be a one-off event that could be experienced as a trauma or witnessing a one-off violent crime. There are other types of trauma which could potentially be repeated um, and those traumas are likely to have an impact on a young person's development. Um, so we know that for young people experiencing some of these early traumas can be very frightening. But ways of managing those frightening experiences, if they continue to become chronic, um, can have can also have an impact on a young person's ability to make sense of danger in the future and their ability to respond appropriately when they are exposed to danger. But we're going to cover that a little bit more when we think about the impact on the brain. So some of the things that we described in as in terms of the adverse childhood experiences, which would be seen as likely to be chronic, um, frightening and distressing events. So experiencing physical, emotional or sexual abuse, so harm coming to your body or, or your emotions or your mind, being neglected, um, being exposed to um, your parents perhaps frightening, um, fighting, physically fighting and feeling very frightened, seeing a parent who becomes really unavailable because of their own mental health difficulties or because of their use of substances to help them manage their own experiences or distress. And again, with uh, divorce, I'm a, I'm a person who is divorced and I have three children and um, I'm always mindful of, of how this feels for so many of us who are divorced as well. Um, so what, what we know about divorce is that it brings uncertainty and change for young people and it can be more likely to be accompanied with some kind of conflict, um, potentially, particularly during that period of time when parents might be separating. Um, so it's more the conflict around divorce than the actual divorce itself, which can be experienced um, as uh, adverse. OK. And I think the other important thing is, is that trauma can have different impacts on different people. So an experience for a car crash for one person could potentially be exceedingly traumatic and they may not feel able to get back in a car. They might suffer with symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And for another person who may similar experience a very similar um, one off trauma, their experience and response to that could be very different and they might find it much easier to get back in a car and driving again um, and they might not experience those symptoms of PTSD. So I think the, we, although we know quite a lot about the things that are likely to have an impact on us, we also know that for every person that can, it, it can be experienced differently.
I'm not going to have time to go into much detail on relational versus developmental trauma or the big T and little t, but I don't know if m many of you have read Gabor Mate's book called The Myth of Normal, but he really thinks a lot about the impact of adverse experiences, particularly through our childhood and how they affect the physical, our physical and mental health. And really as a society, how we are continuously exposing our whole communities, everyone to, to trauma and um, increased rates of, of pressure and kind of the pathologizing really of people's difficulties of managing some of the very painful and frightening experiences they might have had in their life. It's a really interesting read. It's a big book, um, but it is worth a read and it's on Audible as well. So this is a, a nice example. We often use it quite a lot in schools and we talk about, imagine if you are swimming or being um, on the edge of shark infested waters. So if we put ourselves in the shoes of a child who's surrounded, trapped and powerless by big, fast and unpredictable sharks. They're in that water, they're waiting, they're anticipating, they're expecting and or fearing being attacked. In those moments, I'm sure that if you've ever been to another part of the world where there are more predator-like or even jellyfish in the water, you may have had this experience, that feeling of fright, being frightened under threat, outnumbered on edge, and that kind of sense of a piece of brushing seaweed or a lurking shadow or a ripple in the water, sending your body and mind into overdrive. Now, in that scenario, what can you do if you're that young person who is afraid, terrified, thinks is going to be hurt? You've got several choices. You can swim away and get out of there as fast as possible. You can punch or wrestle the shark. So you can become shark like yourself in those waters. You could freeze and stay incredibly still and hope you won't be spotted. Or you can pretend to be that feared shark itself. If you don't have the physical strength or knowledge or know how to fight or swim away from sharks, then how are you going to respond in that situation? What behaviours are you going to do? How are you going to manage? It could be really confusing as well if sometimes that shark that comes up to you isn't just a shark, it turns into a dolphin. So one moment you're with someone or something that's fearful and the next minute they're being nice and kind. This can be really, really confusing. And then imagine you're taken out of the shark infested water and you're popped in a swimming pool. How are you going to feel in that empty pool? How are you going to respond um, to that empty pool in that new experience? How are you going to make sense of something that you might feel on your leg in those waters? So it's just an interesting way of imagining what it might be like for a young person who's living in quite a traumatised, stressful environment. When they transition into a safe environment, their survival response is not going to turn off. That child is going to be investing a lot of time and energy continually being in survival mode and even those small everyday things that a child might have to do in their life like move from one classroom to another or do another what or go to a different event which is they're not used to a slightly raised voice face just changes in in body language can for that young person trigger that that life or death response now, earlier, you were thinking a little bit about regulation um, and how we can do things to upregulate and downregulate, support ourselves as well as young people. What we know if we think about this idea called the window of tolerance, the window of tolerance is what um, we were talking about earlier is that space, that sweet spot where you don't feel under too much stress or pressure. You're in a good zone for learning. It's a good place to be. You can connect with what's happening in your environment. When we get hyper aroused, we find ourselves getting anxious, angry, feeling out of control, overwhelmed. The body goes into fight or flight mode. And it's again, these are kind of like those fight, flight, stress response reactions that can just take over. And we also know at the other end of that extreme, and this can particularly happen for adults and young people who have had 
chronic hyperarousal that their system just ends up shutting down. It can't take that hyperarousal anymore. Um, it's exhausting. And we know that with hypoarousal, young people can, or adults or anyone in this zone of wind, um, this uh, um, analogy, can you move into that spacey, zoned out, numb or frozen body going into shutdown. And again, this is not something that someone chooses. It's very much a reaction. Um, and what we know is for young people who've experienced a trauma that it shrinks that window of tolerance. So that window gets smaller and a young person is much more likely to be triggered into hyper or hypo arousal. And a lot of the things that I do in my job as a clinical psychologist and some of the other interventions that we've been hearing about earlier on is what we're trying to do is help a young person grow their window of tolerance through learning um, certain ways of making sense of, of the world and then their physiological response. And we're going to be thinking about that um, later on in the presentation. So let's just have a bit of an, a, a, a very quick think about the impact of trauma on brain development. So I know you're all going to be much more experienced and expert probably in brain development than me, so I'm not going to um, teach you to suck eggs. But if we think about how um, trauma impacts on brain development, it's just helpful to think about how the infant brain develops. And so we know we've got the brain stem which is the lower part of the brain which develops first. It controls our responses to survival and automatic responses such as breathing, sleep and temperature regulation. Then we've got the limbic area and this mid part of the brain develops next. So two important areas in this are the amygdala and the hippocampus. So the amygdala is like the brain smoke detector and it plays an important role in the regulation of emotion memories and survival instincts and the hippocampus connects the lower and upper parts of the brain and again is important in the expression of emotion and in memory function um, and that's where that cortisol is released when, that, when a person is experiencing tr stress or fear and then the cortex um, is the upper part of the brain which does develop last we know that that part of the brain doesn't stop developing until about the age of 24 which we consider the end of adolescence and it really is that part of the brain which is responsible for our ability to pause think reflect to concentrate to problem solve to learn um, and we know that the connection between this part of the brain I'm going to go on to describe that in a slightly different way and how we do a lot of work with teachers and parents to understand the brain development um, we know that that connection between those two parts of the brain is a really important way for young people to learn to regulate and express their emotions in ways that will hopefully lead to them getting their, their physical and emotional needs met. So one of the ways that we, we describe this, which is really quite a nice way, and I don't know if any of you on the call have, have heard of the, the brain house that comes from Dan Siegel, a psychiatrist and neuroscientist in the States, and he talks about dividing the brain into two to make it really straightforward and simple for, for people to understand. He talks about the downstairs brain being that part of our brain which is about fight or flight. It's where our emotions live, it's where survival is based and it's very well developed when we're young babies. And then he talks about the control tower, which is the prefrontal cortex. And that's the bit of our brain that takes time to develop and grow and keeps get, growing and developing all the way through to age 24. So that's where our planning, our organising, our problem solving and flexibility comes in. That's where our ability to learn, read other people's emotions, to control our impulses um, are, all become very, all develop. And so as our children go from babies through toddlerdom up to um, children and into adolescence, our task as adults really is to support the integration and the development of the communication between the upstairs and the downstairs brain. Now, in this picture, you can see the upstairs has flipped off the downstairs. And what we know is, is that when the downstairs brain is activated and our young people or adults are in fight or flight mode. That connection with that logical reasoning, making sense of the world part of the brain is disconnected. The staircase between the two is no longer connected. 
And that's why often when we're in these states ourselves, if you recall having an argument with someone or you trying to calm a child down who's in that state where they have flipped their lid, we call it, um, it's almost impossible for a person to listen properly and follow a command or have a conversation. Um, and that's because we know that in that moment, the brain's way to protect you from getting slowed down from reacting to look after yourself means that it's just cut that connection with the thinking part of the brain. So a big part of the work that we do as psychologists is helping to teach children and parents to understand and notice when the young person is about to flip their lid, some of the contexts which are more likely to lead to a young person flipping their lid and help the adults around a young person bring their backs their upstairs brain back online so that they can feel regulated again and start to develop those kind of collaboration and problem solving skills. A lot of the problems that we have with adults is often we want to jump in and we want to problem solve the young people and others before we've been able to get the upstairs brain connected. And what we know is, and we're going to go on to think about that more in a minute, is that connection before correction. So we cannot engage in learning or supporting a young person solve a problem or be able to sit in a, an environment where they can learn until we've regained this connection. And the way we need to do that is with is through finding ways to connect the, with them as another adult, to validate their emotions, to help calm their amygdala and their downstairs brain down. And again, in the earlier presentation, there are other ideas about how sensory experience of a young person can potentially help with that reconnection and this visual is really helpful for families because what it does is it slows everybody down and it takes a lot of blame away and in terms of thinking about trauma it really helps make sense of if a young person is spending a lot of their childhood in that survival mode with their upstairs brain not sitting on top of their downstairs brain without opportunities to develop the integration between the two, making sense of feelings, putting them into words, then naturally a young person's ability to develop in the upstairs brain in that prefrontal cortex is going to be impacted. So just going on and having a little bit more of a think about the actual cognitive neuroscience, what we know is is th this is the most highly researched part of the brain in terms of um, thinking about making the link between the impact of trauma and, and, and brain development. And so overactive stimulation of the amygdala re region in response to threat is the single most um, robust finding reported in the literature. So for many young people or people who have that experience, they will describe constantly feeling threatened or triggered in, in a range of situations that constantly waiting for something bad to happen, even in those neutral situations. Um, and then just as I mentioned before with the upstairs and downstairs brain, this threat hypersensitivity creates a dampening of the frontal lobe's ability to modulate threat perception once the, the limbic system has become overactive. So if you go into flight, might, flight mode and you stay in that zone, then your opportunities to really understand what's happening in the environment around you and learn from that go down. Um, and it also affects the ability of the hippocampus to then help consolidate and reconsolidate memories and again this links for young people or adults who might experience PTSD um, and what we know is is that memory is exquisitely sensitive to stress um, so that the impact really or in this part of the brain of being constantly exposed to threat um, it has huge impacts across the rest of the brain and it can actually lead to young people, particularly if they're having these experiences in those preschool years. Um, if you're constantly exposed to some kind of trauma or threat, then what can happen is, is that you don't learn how to interpret other trauma or, or threats accurately. So your perception 
um, of risky or threatening situations can change. And that can kind of go in one direction or another. So it could mean that you aren't very good or you're not very sensitive to picking up on threat or risk situations. Or it could go the other way in that you're constantly experiencing things as threatening when they might not be. And you have this kind of constant false alarm going on. And I'm sure for all of you, you'll have, you'll have met young people who may have coped different in those diff their brains and their way their brains that continue to work and cope differently with that. And I guess this takes us on to kind of just thinking about that first four years of life, what your typical development should and hopefully look like. In the left hand image here is your survival needs are very much being ideally met by your primary caregivers, which is enabling you to develop and build within your brain the ability to regulate, developing your social and emotional skills and understanding of yourself and developing those higher order cognitive um, abilities, which will be for young people up, around up to the age of four, we think about learning to read and write. Now, on the other side here, we can see that if a young person's safety needs are not met, then what we will find is, is that their, that experience will mean that the majority of their efforts and energies in their brain will be stuck in that survival mode, giving them less opportunities to develop um, the ability or what it feels like to have good regulation, to develop those social, um, social pro-social um, pro skills and that ability to read emotions in others as well as re um, regulate them in yourselves. And again, that opportunity to learn and develop those skills, which are certainly needed in the prefrontal cortex, um, become more, there's less time and energy and less of that brain development supporting that. And we often see that young people presenting, I see a lot of young people presenting in year nine, around the age of 13, when young people are starting to need to, to rely on more of their executive functioning skills, their ability to organise themselves. Um, and that's often a time when we might see an increase of referrals in young people presenting with challenges around behaviour or anxiety. And quite often it's a time where I've discovered with doing um, a family history and often some neuroscience as well, that that young person's early difficulties are having an impact at this point when the expectations around that young person's ability to, to kind of be in this kind of top part of the, tri the triangle are actually becoming becoming higher. But that young person might have done a lot of masking um, to kind of survive in the school environment and not stand out and actually by the time they get to year nine they're choosing their um, options for GCSE trying to manage and negotiate social relationships which become even more complex particularly for girls this is the time where we see a, a significant increase in referrals for young people who might otherwise seem to have been coping well and some of the newest research on social cognition, and again, this really links in when we're doing assessments for these young people, particularly at the moment within the NDD pathway in Suffolk, we're getting lots of referrals for young people who are adolescents or, or 9, 10, 11, 12 with uh, queries about ADHD or ASD. And so it's just really interesting because quite often these young people may have experienced some adversity in their last and in, in their life. And it's really trying to pick out how to make sense of that because I think parents feel really um, find it really challenging when we're going through that referral information and we talk about early adversity and how that might be have impacted the young person's neurodevelopment and then I think it's really hard for parents to consider a young person who may present with very ADHD like behaviours or some difficulties around social communication that they're not being considered for ADHD or ASD assessment. And I think when we look at what this, what the brain, the, the neuroscience tells us about childhood diversity being predicted of poor cognitive function, but actually more specifically, we can see that it's linked to strongly associated with cognitive and social cognitive difficulties. So we know, for example, that young people have had exposure with greater exposure to childhood diversity. There's a higher correlation with their ability to recognise emotions in others. And interesting, they looked at a range of adversity factors which were, could, were the most predictive and physical neglect was the biggest predictor. 
Um, and there was some mediation by this with poor maternal care once a, a follow on study looked at that. Um, so we really know that having one's physical needs met as a child and a young person is actually an absolutely fundamental building block for social cognition. And there's been some kind of talk in the in the literature about the um, developing of cognitive biases, which we talk a lot about in CBT. But actually, this research is showing that there are other more fundamental challenges to social cognition, which also links to the ability to regulate emotions within yourself. Um, and I think this research is just really showing that what's happening in the brain isn't just happening in one region of the brain. There's this real kind of uh, it, it, this effect which is is going going on throughout the brain, and we can't really oversimplify this. Um, and there's also links with being able to accurately recognise and process social relevant stimuli for some of those young people who've been exposed to adversity in, in early life. So what we would expect to see in a child who may have experienced traumas and range of things here, I'm really conscious of time. So distrust and difficulty in forming relate friendships, anxiety, preferring routines and not liking unplanned changes, having different masks, so potentially behaving differently in different contests, and sometimes acting like a different person. Again, that could be viewed as an adaptation pushing people away if they get too close. And at the same time, we can also see young people who get really super close, um, being defensive, easily aggressive, struggling with anger, sleep difficulties and nightmares, um, giving a real sense of independence, a resistance to relying on others, the rejection of support, becoming zoned out, distracted, poor concentration, seeming like they're in their own bubble, in their own head and withdrawn. And, and difficulties with memory. And just thinking about the earlier presentation where we're, we're looking at young people who may have sensory processing difficulties, many of the things that, that, that were described in the earlier presentation can also be seen here. And that's the challenge, isn't it, for us as professionals as we try to unpick and make sense of the behaviours that we're seeing in young people uh, and what could be underlying those or explaining those behaviours. Because of course, that will lead to what we need to do next to support young people. This is just a slide really which just illustrates the huge uh, range of impact that childhood trauma has on young people across their behaviour, their relationships, physical health, brain development, cognition, um, emotions um, and mental health as well. And just thinking about those threat responses that you also talked about earlier, so we know fight, it's all about confronting the threat, flight, running away from the threat and trying to get away from it. Um, free, so shutting down to block out the threat, so disassociation, numbness or shutdown. And then we're, within the trauma work, Beacon House has put some resources at the end. I've got some lovely resources here. Um, they also talk about fawn, where you would potentially be appeasing the threat, so being very people-pleasing being very codependent and having a lack of boundaries. And I haven't got much time. I can see I've only got seven minutes left. And I want to be able to move on to thinking about what, what, what next? What do we do to support young people who've experienced trauma? Um, but I think it's important to also recognise that many of the things that may um, trigger a young person's threat response could be multisensory. So there could be a smell. They could be a certain sound. They could be a sense of, of a sensory feeling that may is triggering for a young person. It could be a particular phase that an adult might use, which could be linked to the words or language that a um, an abuser might have used. So it's just really being mindful of what could be those potential range of triggers because we are multi-sensory um, and so all of those senses could potentially create a trigger response. And again, we're thinking about age four and under, this can be exceptionally difficult for a young person to articulate. So I think we really do become detectives and rely hugely on the adults and young people's lives to make sense of what might be happening in their environment when they may be fall, falling into one of these categories um, in, in their learning or home environment.
And again, just to really uh, kind of be clear that that, that alert overlap between some of those neurodevelopmental um, difficulties or diversity that we're seeing parents um, wondering and trying to make sense of behaviour symptoms that look like ADHD or behaviour symptoms that look like um, autism, um, there is a lot of overlap. And then again, that goes back to us as professionals getting really skilled at making sense of a young person and a family story and what's going to be most helpful for them moving forward and to enable that young person's needs to be met. So in the last five minutes, I'm just going to really run through some practical strategies um, because the really good news is, is the evidence shows that brains can recover from the impacts of early adversity. We know that young brains are very neuroplastic and it's really thinking about how do we how do we identify young people who may have experienced trauma and provide them with this support um, as soon as possible. And you all all know access to specialist professional help, whether that's with yourselves, paediatricians or other um, developmental care um, and also with mental health support is actually uh, it's really hard to get in front of a professional and have these conversations so the more that we can equip our communities to have a better understanding and provide more trauma-informed environments for our young people um, the more likely are those young people's um, are not going to be further traumatized by the environment they're in so one of the things, the key things that the re research shows is, is the importance of relationships. So the more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he'll be able to recover from trauma and thrive. So relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. So we talk a lot with schools about this because what we know is, is that quite often the young people who, who do require this support can often be the young people who are more difficult to engage because of their experiences in their early life and because of their challenges around development and developing pro-social behaviours and being able to regulate their own emotions and communicate with others. So often it is those young people who are really struggling that need the most support and most opportunity to develop healthy and, and, and uh, compassionate and curious relationships. So we think about um, strategic relationship building and how we often, through a model of consultation, meet with school staff to enable them to talk about young people they're worried about and how can they kind of support those young people who seem really difficult to engage and find ways to work with them um, so that they don't continue to perpetuate the cycle of of not being able to build those healthy relationships. And we kind of use this term which Karen Treesman who's a very uh, brilliant psychologist in the area of trauma she talks about every interaction is an intervention so every interaction all, all of us have with a young person is an opportunity for, for an intervention and that kind of goes back to the idea of therapeutic dosing which comes from Bruce Perry that these little incremental things that can happen in a child's day make a huge difference when you add them all up so that's what we can think about keeping environments and people in those environments as being positive and compassionate and caring and kind and showing an interest and thinking about the way we use our voice the way we use our body language the way we use touch the way we use distance depending on a young person's needs and previous history and experiences and that requires time and it requires really getting to know young people, being curious and not making assumptions um, about what their behaviour means, but really trying to peel back those layers. We know that for young people, boundaries are really containing, but it, it really matters how boundaries are delivered. Um, because if young people are in school environments who are really struggling in these areas and the behaviour policies in schools can feel quite draconian and quite punishing then for those young people who are struggling more in these areas they can very quickly get stuck in a very negative behavior cycle where those boundaries actually stop giving a young person a sense of safety which is what they're really there for um, and instead start to feel um, a, a, another threat um, and our young people need to grow up and learn to tolerate boundaries and and see the value of them 
Um, and again, we talk a lot about how teachers and adults in young people's lives really need to develop the skill of connecting with a young person before we move on to imposing boundaries or talking to young people about why they might need to um, do something now based on some of the earlier behaviours. We talk about the PACE model with schools, um, about the idea of playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy, and how can we provide more opportunities for some young people who might have experienced quite significant relational trauma and not had this experience in their lives. This can feel really scary and, and weird. Um, so the more opportunities we can provide those young people to have these experiences and experience them as safe and feeling good, um, and helping them um, to do that when their upstairs and downstairs brain is connected, the more opportunities we're going to give those young people um, to develop and grow and thrive. We talk about managing distress and, and, and how to kind of help upregulate and downregulate, and some of that was covered in our earlier talk. Um, the power of language, how do we um, use language to set the tone for the nature of the support we offer? So if we're talking about unacceptable behaviour, maybe we if we know more we can talk about it as understandable behaviour. If we're saying that child's really avoidant or defiant, perhaps we can actually say they're in flight survival mode or they're in fight survival mode, coping with what feels like a threat. So sometimes aggression and, and frightening, feeling frightened can be used as rather than saying aggression. And this manipulative attention seeking, talking about it as attachment seeking, withdrawn cautious, rude, self-protective, not engaging, doesn't feel safe yet. And if you think about if we use those differences in language, then it leads us to do something different and understand that young person's needs beyond their behaviour um, are better. Um, and there's some ideas around coping strategies here, which will all come around in, in the head, the resources and with that we can think about different ways of exploring um, with young people what it might feel like when they're feeling scared or anxious and I, I guess the last thing I wanted to say is about skills development so the brain research the trauma brain search research is really showing that things that we can do including therapies that combine strategies for improving social thinking and regulation regulating emotions as well as cognitive skills are likely to be really valuable. So we need to obviously have a relational exposed to uh, a relational approach to supporting young people who've experienced adverse life experiences or trauma, but we really also need to provide them with the opportunity to develop those skills that they may have missed out on developing when they are feeling regulated and when they are feeling safe. And a lot of the work I've done in secondary schools is helping teachers understand that for some young people who were 13 or 14 because of what happened in their early life their actual emotion ability to regulate their emotions is very much based like a three or four year old so we need to kind of get them to be engaged with education feeling safe and from there we can actually work with them to support them um, to develop those skills rather than expecting them to have those skills and punishing them when they don't um, the things that make this hard, well, time, isn't it? And all of the, the whenever you're assessing a young person and thinking about their needs, we know that time in the system is difficult. We need a young, an adult and a parent to understand what's going on for a young person without feeling blamed. I think lots of families feel hugely blamed if they, um, if a trauma is an explanation for some of the neurodevelopmental difficulties that a young person might be having. Um, um, and just really trying to help everybody understand the balance of discipline and warmth. I think that's a real challenge for staff who work with young people as well as parents. And I'm just going to finish there, really, so because I know I'm three minutes over time. Many thanks, Beth. That was a great talk and had some really positive feedback. Um, I think you could have could have talked for a lot longer. Actually, uh, there, some some big big topics emerged from there. I've just, I don't have any financial connections to this book, but uh, I've been gradually going through it. And I'd recommend um, people to have a look if they have the chance because it does. Certainly, where I work, there are a lot of children who are diagnosed with ADHD, who don't have ADHD, who are on stimulant medication, who where medication is actually making them worse because they actually have a lot of their development is is being challenged through trauma and early life events 
which can also be imprinted and inherited as well through through uh, through family families. So um, yeah, a any questions for Beth? Just seeing Caroline's comment, and it's I I talk with families all the time who've described huge traumas that they experienced when their child was a baby before they were born and, and early life. And it's so hard when they've got a 13 year old who's presenting in a way that is very difficult and they just don't know the way forward and they're looking for an ASD or an ADHD diagnosis. And it's so hard to think about those early traumas that have been so significant for that parent or that family and make that link for them because it, it is really painful. Um, and really difficult because it kind of te it requires a, a new way forward and we don't actually have resources within our system to support those families who might have had those experiences mm -hmm. so I, I think it's a real challenge and I think we need to think how we talk about this differently with families um, so that it feels less blaming and that that we come up with support and intervention so I'm developing the early intervention part of the um, mental health portfolio and I really want to have things which are going to be supporting younger children and their parents develop um, relationships so using VIG for example which is video integration uh, therapy and other different ways to address some of these bits that are missing in our current mental health services. Totally totally agree and I think the other challenge we have a lot of parents see see diagnoses autism ADHD as being the goal for accessing service and will answer all the questions they have. But I think kind of re realigning or resyncing that thought process into other areas that you mentioned can only be a good thing. Um, but it is clinically challenging because a lot of parents then feel that they're being victimised or that it's they're being blamed for, for some of these early life events. And the, the reality is, is that those adverse experiences will have had a actual impact on the brain development so it's not that we're saying that they haven't they are their young people are presenting with the same neurodevelopmental profile of a young person who hasn't had trauma it's just how do you make sense of it and how do you provide that family and young person with the right support that they need in school and at home and that's really hard isn't it because and that's we, we why we have that resource no, and that's why we've had a, a Andrea talk as well and, and lining that up with an understanding of sensory processing and the effect of learning. And you, you mentioned the, the building and the, the lower building being so important to get the foundations right first because of the, this fight or flight response. I'm conscious of time, yep. um, so we might move on. Um, but this again ties in quite nicely with our next speaker. I'm also conscious of the fact we've been going two and a half hours and haven't had a break. So that's my fault. So would people like a break or can we can we continue? I'm conscious of time. I probably will keep going if that's OK, because uh, I am I know that P Pascal needs to go. Um, if that's OK with you. So if I can introduce Dr. and I apologize if I've got, got the pronunciation wrong. Dr. Patricka, who's an assistant professor in psychology at the University of Essex, who will, I suppose, be talking more about how to measure um, some of the things we've been talked about more objectively than than, than uh, people's opinions is actually how, how we can use other tools uh, to to see how we can help progress child development. And his talk is going to be on biobehavioral synchrony. Yes, hello. I'm a bit new to the Teams. Can you see my screen? Yep, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, brilliant. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, brilliant talk so far, especially uh, the last one, because it's also very close to what uh, my research is about. So just um, a couple of words about myself. Um, I'm an assistant professor in psychology here at the University of Essex. I have been here for three years. Uh, before that, um, I was in Germany, in, in the US and in Switzerland. And what uh, what I mainly do for my research is to try to come up with a social neuroscience of human attachment. And this is what this basically means is depicted here is that we would like to come up with neuroanatomical models of both organized attachment here on the left and disorganized and disrupted attachment uh, here on, on the right. And 
how uh, you can see clearly and nicely from, from the right uh, neuroanatomical model of disorganized attachment lambda that we also talk about hypoarousal and hyperarousal states. So this really very nicely overlaps with the previous talk by Dr. Mosley. So um, there is lots of stuff that we could actually um, talk about and carry on discussing. But what I would like to actually focus about today is a slightly different topic, namely biobehavioral synchrony which um, builds on these theoretical considerations of the neuroanatomy of, of attachment, but goes a little bit further because it looks at two brains at the same time and not only at one brain in isolation. And what I would like to do today is first to ask the question what bi-behavioral synchrony is and why we should care about it, and then ask the question of how we actually measure biobehavioral synchrony and especially the neural, uh, the neural part of biobehavioral synchrony, which is interpersonal neural synchrony. Then I would like to show you some of our results of uh, doing the biobehavioral synchrony research in parent-child uh, dyads. And finally, I would like to talk about some future implications, especially regarding uh, neurodiverse families. But let's start uh, with the beginning and let's start by asking the questions, what, uh, question what biobehavioral synchrony actually is and why we should care. And at this stage, I always like to show this picture which very nicely illustrates that humans are social beings and humans are social beings from the very beginning to the very end. And that this doesn't come just by chance, but that this comes from the fact that our bodies and brains are actually wired to be connected to others and that we need social connection, not only to survive, but also to thrive. And this need for social connection, of course, is extremely prominent and crucial uh, early in life, where we need a very strong social connection to caregivers to regulate our physiological needs, temperature, food intake, sleep, but also to grow emotionally and, and socially and cognitively, so to develop all these skills that we have already heard about to regulate our emotions and to become healthy adults. We also need social connection more strongly again when we grow older, when we cannot again regulate many physiological processes by ourselves. But there is also a space between early life and, and late life where we also need social connection and we really crucially need it uh, to survive. And this has been shown quite recently by large meta-analyses that have looked at hundreds of thousands or millions of participants um, and found that social isolation or being lonely, being disconnected from others can literally kill us. So what these studies have shown that there is uh, up to a 30% increased likelihood of mortality when we feel that we don't have good and enough social relationships, when we feel socially disconnected and when we don't feel, when we feel isolated and lonely. And very importantly, this risk for increased risk for mortality when being socially isolated is stronger than the risk uh, for, of mortality when we um, engage in heavy smoking or excessive alcohol um, drinking. So the social connection is really something fundamental for us and fundamental for our survival. And therefore, the question for me, for my research, but also I think in general, how this works within the human body and within the human brain is really crucial and we have already heard a little bit about it from the previous speaker and we would also like to extend on this and to understand how social connection actually works and one method to investigate social connection amongst many others is biobehavioral synchrony and this field has really been pioneered by Ruth Feldman who is a professor from Israel who has been researching uh, synchrony for the last uh, 20, 30 or even more years. And here in this nice graphics from one of her papers in 2017, she very nicely depicts what uh, biobehavioral synchrony actually is. Uh, so biobehavioral synchrony is the temporal alignment of many different uh, physiological uh, parameters and including and uh, our behavior. And most prominently, it is assessed on four different modalities. So the first modality is behavioral synchrony, so how we act together uh, in terms of our eye gaze, our 
vocalizations, our, um, for example, also touch. So all we do in our behavior that links us to the other person, and we can see on the left that the synchrony is supposed to be or is thought to be strongest in the most intimate, in the most in the closest relationships, like with our parents or romantic partners, and then so, uh, thought to decrease the more distant others uh, become. But this doesn't only apply for behavioral synchrony, we can also measure synchrony in terms of our physiology, and one very prominent measure that is employed here is heart rate. So we know that if people do uh, things together, um, if they are strongly socially connected, their heart rates uh, start to become more strongly aligned. We can also measure synchrony in terms of endocrinology, so by measuring hormone secretion. And two very prominent hormones that are discussed in this, in this context are oxytocin, which is a social connection, a bonding hormone, and cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And here we can already see that synchrony can involve both more positive factors and more negative factors. So we can also become synchronized uh, with somebody else who is in distress. And we might also start feeling this distress. And then, of course, the question is whether this synchrony is actually beneficial for both of, of us or just for or either of us. So we have to also consider that synchrony can sometimes be related to negative states. And finally, synchrony is more recently uh, being assessed by means of brain activation. And that's also something that we are doing quite prominently in uh, our lab here at the University of Essex. Now, I like to think of this synchrony in terms of uh, a emitter and receiver kind of mechanism, especially for the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony or the synchrony uh, in the neural activation, because without being on the same wavelength, literally speaking, we are not able to understand each other. So if my brain is not on the same wavelength as your brain now listening to me, then my message is probably not being understood. So I very much hope that what I'm emitting right now is reaching your neural receivers with the same message so that we can actually understand what is going on. Another quite nice take on synchrony is put forward by uh, Shir Atzil, also a researcher from Israel, who, who says that this synchrony or this, this mutual dancing of the bodies and the brains is especially important for regulation, for co-regulation. So if the child, for example, is feeling distressed or uncomfortable and starts to signal uh, their attachment needs and the need for co-regulation, then um, the caregiver should first synchronize to the child's um, utterances or the child's behavior in order to understand what is going on, but should then try to maximally desynchronize in order to regulate the child. I mean, it doesn't really help much if the child cries and then the caregiver also starts crying, right? The caregiver should rather go into the opposite state and try to positively influence the child to get back to their homeostasis. And so this interplay of synchronized states and desynchronized states in the physiology and in the brain activity is a very strong and important prerequisite for successful co-regulation. And we also know that synchrony um, leads to uh, brain development. And one of the effects of behavioral and physiological synchrony on the brain is that it actually helps different brain networks to start speaking to each other, to start synchronizing. And as we have heard from the previous talk, one of these um, connections that is so important, for example, is between the more emotional regions and the prefrontal cortical control regions. And this connection needs to be built and needs to be reinforced. And one way how this connection is actually built between the prefrontal cortex and the more emotional areas is through synchrony that is induced by the co-regulation from the caregiver. So synchrony is extremely important for people to interact with one another, to understand each other, but also for development and particularly for brain development. Now at this point in time, I always like to show this very uh, nice study that was um, done a couple of years ago by uh, another group of researchers who um, artificially introduced synchrony or uh, asynchrony 
in an interaction between children and uh, experimenters in the lab. The problem is that I don't know whether you will actually be able to hear this. So I'll just try to play and can you tell me whether you actually start hearing some sound when the first speaker comes online? Oh, I'm yep. to tell you, about a recent article you can hear it? Yeah. Brilliant. I'm paired with my colleague Kate Anderson and the director of our research group, Dr. Laurel Trainer. Our paper is entitled Interpersonal Synchrony Encourages Pro Social Behavior in Infants. And in this paper, for the first time, we explore how moving to music can be a social experience for young infants. Previous work has shown that when adults move in synchrony together, for example, by marching, dancing, or singing, they're later more likely to display affiliative behaviors towards one another. Uh, this is not the case if their movements are not aligned in time or out of synchrony. Interpersonal synchrony is a key component of musical behavior, and from very early in life, infants are active music listeners. There's a body of research about how infants hear music and how they move to music, but our work is the first to experimentally investigate the social nature of musical engagement in infancy. <laughs> During the first phase of the experiment, the infant is placed in an infant carrier worn by the assistant. The experimenter stands across from the infant and music plays over the loudspeakers. The assistant bounces the infant to the beat of the song and the experimenter facing the infant also bounces, either in synchrony with how the baby is bounced or out of synchrony, for example, at a faster or slower tempo. Subsequently, we measured the infant's helpfulness towards the experimenter. To do this, the experimenter would try to complete a goal, like drawing pictures with markers, putting balls in a bucket, or pinning dishcloths up on a clothesline. In each trial, the experimenter would accidentally drop the object she needed to complete the task, and the infant was given 30 seconds to respond. We found that infants who had been bounced in synchrony with the experimenter were significantly more likely to assist with the dropped items and to help early in the trials, compared to infants who had been bounced out of synchrony with that person's movements. In experiment two, the experimenter and assistant bounced at the same speed, but in opposition to each other. With this second group of babies, we also found increased rates of helpfulness comparable to those of the babies from the synchronous bouncing condition of the first experiment. This suggests that it's the contingency and time-locked nature of the movements that drives the effect of interpersonal synchrony, as we predicted. In sum, these findings suggest that interpersonal synchrony significantly influences the social behavior of 14 month olds Interpersonal synchrony is a common experience in this infant social world, and caregivers often engage in tasks like singing, dancing, bouncing, and clapping with their children. Our results suggest for the first time that such activities promote socially cohesive behaviors between infants and caregivers. All right, so what this, did this very nice um, study do and what did the results show? So as you have seen from the video, what the experimenters did is to either bounce 14 month old infants in sync with the experimenter or out of sync with the experimenter and then tested how helpful these infants were towards the experimenter. And the main finding was that 14 month old infants were more likely to engage in altruistic or helping behavior after having been bounced to music in synchrony with the experimenter. And what also was shown is that even anti faust face bouncing um, revealed the same effect, right? So when um, the, the infants were more helpful when they were doing exactly the same thing at the same time with the experimenter, but this also worked when uh, the experimenter and the child were always bouncing opposite of each other. So what really matters for this effect on helping behavior is the contingency of the synchronous movements and not exactly that the people were doing exactly the same thing at the same time. So it's sometimes also a little bit like a give and take, like a, re a reciprocal interaction that is harmonious, that is, um, that is attuned to one another. And that's very often what happens between children and caregivers um, usually, right? So that uh, the caregiver does something and then the child um, 
reciprocates and so on and so forth. And so what this suggests is that synchrony is a, a crucial component of actually connecting people to one another, making them feel that they belong to the same group, that they have the same intentions, the same feelings, which then makes them more likely to help and to, to show uh, altruistic behavior. So with this first part of my presentation, I, was, uh, I intended to show you what biobehavioral synchrony is and why we should actually care about it. So showing you that it, biobehavioral synchrony involves behavior and physiology, but also brain activity. And that it's really important because it's one of these social glues that actually connects us to others and that makes us more likely to help others. What I would like to um, focus on in the second part now is how we can actually measure biobehavioral synchrony. And there are different ways uh, of doing so. And as you have seen already before, uh, there are these four main domains that biobehavioral synchrony is uh, measured within or discussed within. And the first of them is behavior. And of course, if you, we want to look at um, synchrony in the behavior, what we usually do is behavioral observation. So we have participants come to the lab and they um, perform certain tasks and we film them. And then those video recordings are coded by trained observers that look for specific patterns of, for example, reciprocity or emotional attunement or how often uh, people look at each other, how often they touch each other. And this is then quantified and um, compared to some other kinds of measures. We can also measure um, synchrony in terms of physiology. And we have seen that one of the main measures is, for example, heart rate. So we can have two or more people in the lab and they have heart rate monitors and then we can compare their signals and look whether at the same time they were uh, roughly showing um, the same increase or decrease in the heart rate and we can also then compare these how strongly these uh, heart rate changes were related to one another. Well, another measure could for example be skin conductance which, which is also a measure of um, arousal because it basically measures how much we are sweating and if this aligns with other people then again we have another indication of synchrony on the physiological level. We can then measure synchrony in endocrinology or in hormone secretion and this can be done in different ways. It can be either done by getting blood samples from participants or uh, saliva samples which is a little bit less invasive and these uh, measures can then again be correlated with one another. And finally we have synchrony measured on the level of the brain in terms of brain activity, where we look at simultaneous brain activity in and decreases. Just before we start to focus more on the brain activity, I just want to say that, of course, the synchrony in these four different domains will have quite uh, different time resolutions or, or time scales, right? So the behavioral synchrony can, or the physiological synchrony can be really quick. It can be in the range of milliseconds, um, uh, couple of 100 milliseconds or, or maybe seconds, but then the endocrinology, the hormone secretion is much slower. So this will be in the range of minutes or maybe hours. And then the brain activity again can be quite um, in, a, in a quite a short time scale. So we always have to be, of course, quite um, cautious when we associate these different synchronies with one another because they occur at quite different time scales. But now focusing more specifically on brain activity, what we have been um, using during the last 10 years or so in our lab is so-called functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or in short, FNIRS or FNIRS. And what FNIRS uh, does is to emit infrared light into the outermost layers of the brain. And this infrared light is then traveling in a banana shape until it goes back to the surface and reaches the detector. And by calculating how much of the light is actually lost by going through the outermost layers of the brain and especially through blood vessels that have different concentrations of oxygen rich or oxygen um, depleted blood, we can then derive an indirect measure of brain activity in that area at a certain amount, uh, at a certain time. Now we can do this for individual participants. But what is of course most interesting for us in terms of the synchrony is to look at how these uh, changes in the brain activation increase and decrease actually correlate with one another. Um, 
And uh, what we then do is to see whether this synchrony on the level of the brain can actually then be related to the synchrony on the other levels of the organism, of the physiology, of the behavior, by, of course, as I said before, keeping in mind that quite often these different kinds of biobehavioral synchronies have different time scales and that we can uh, have to be cautious by deriving these kind of correlations. But nonetheless, of course, it's always most interesting if we not only find synchrony in the brain, but we also find synchrony in behavior. And those different types of synchronies are there actually related to one another, because then we can really say that what we see in the brain is actually functionally important, that it is directly related to behavior. So that now we know how biobehavioral synchrony can be measured. So we can now go a little bit more into the details of our research, what we actually do and what we actually find. So let's focus on our research, namely on biobehavioral synchrony in interacting dyads of parents and their children. Uh, so when I was uh, back in Germany, we carried out three different studies uh, on this question, which we call the care studies. So all of, um, and I will be showing you findings of um, the, uh, the second and the third study where we had a large sample of over 140 parent-child dyads and importantly the parents were both moms and dads and the children were about five to six years old which in Germany is the preschool age. And what we did is that we um, had the parents and the children do a certain task that I will just show you in a second and we recorded their behavior. Um, and then we also, of course, used functional near infrared spectroscopy to look at brain uh, activity and especially brain to brain synchrony in parents and their children while they were actually um, carrying out these tasks. What we also did is that in both parents and children, we got a measure of um, caregiving and attachment and interaction quality. So we coded uh, the videos for. Um, uh, reciprocity for, for other kinds of indications of uh, interaction quality and we got um, attachment measures from both the parents in terms of interview, uh, the adult attachment interview and attachment in the children and then we looked at all these different associations. And what the parents and their children actually did was to play puzzles or so-called tangrams in different conditions. So here you can see the collaboration or the cooperation condition where they have one set of blocks and one template and they should be um, puzzling together, helping each other, supporting each other. Um, and as you can nicely see here that the mom is doing something, the child is doing something, they are really interacting in a constructive and positive way. The interaction is harmonious. So that's exactly what we were looking for in the cooperation condition. We then also had an independent or individual condition where both the child and the, the parent had um, one set of puzzles and um, a set of uh, pictures that they had to match and they did it individually. And here the important thing is that they should not see each other and should not be interacting with each other, but otherwise be doing more or less exactly the same thing. And finally, we had a resting condition where both the mother and the child were supposed to not do anything, just lay back and relax, not talk to each other, not uh, close their eyes and not have any physical contact. And this was sometimes a bit challenging because of course for the children, it's, it's quite a new environment and they always want to make sure that the caregivers are there. But we also, we just wanted to have this as an additional um, control condition. So what did we uh, find when we looked at the brain to brain uh, coherence? Uh, sorry, one more uh, one more thing here. So how did we measure the brain to brain coherence? We did so with FNIRS and we focused on two areas uh, in the brain. One was the bilateral dor uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the DLPFC, which is known to be involved in emotion regulation and attention, which is, of course, very important when we are interacting with others. And then also the bilateral temporoparietal junction, the TPJ, which is a core area for theory of mind and mentalization, so to think what other people are thinking, to make sense of their intentions, and that's also something that is very important when we interact with one another. So what did we find? 
We found that when we looked at the interpersonal neural synchrony or the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony in mothers with their children, that there was the strongest synchrony during the cooperation condition when they were solving the puzzle together, and that this synchrony was significantly higher than when the dyads were individually puzzling or when they were resting with their eyes closed. Uh, we also, we then repeated the same uh, study in an independent set of fathers who were interacting with their children. And very interestingly, we found exactly the same pattern, namely that also in fathers, we, we saw increased significantly stronger interpersonal neural synchrony during the cooperation condition as compared to the individual condition and the resting condition. So what we can conclude is that both moms and dads get in sync in terms of their brain activity with their children when they play or when they solve, solve puzzles together. Now, we were then also interested in whether there were some differences between moms and dads when they solve puzzles together with their children. And this slide is a little bit complicated, um, and it's not uh, really that crucial to understand the details here, but the, the take-home message is that even though moms and dads overall both get in synchrony with their kids, the synchrony is slightly differently distributed in those different brain areas. So the main message here really is that although both moms and dads get in sync with their kids, the underlying mechanisms related to behavior or other kinds of factors might actually be slightly different. And we know from previous research, also from Ruth Feldman, that, and maybe from our own experience, that yes, moms and dads, they tend to interact a bit differently with their kids, right? Some interactions might be a bit more calm and organized and some might be a bit more stimulatory and and uh, a little bit jerky and that's maybe something that we also see here right but of course both of these interaction types are extremely meaningful and in fact the more different types of interactions children are exposed to the more different social emotional and cognitive skills they can actually practice and learn now we also wanted to see whether the synchrony we see in the brain is actually related to other types of interaction components. And so we looked at three different things here. So first we looked at behavioral reciprocity shown here uh, most on the left. So this is how harmonious the interaction is, how much turn taking there is, how much behavioral attunement is actually happening. And in mother-child dyads, we found that the more harmonious, the more reciprocal the interaction was on the behavioral level, the more interpersonal neural synchrony there actually was in the brain. We then also looked at the task performance, so how many templates the dyad solved during the time they had to puzzle together, here shown in the middle, and we found that in mother-child pairs, the task performance was positively related to the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. So the more puzzles the dyads solved, the stronger was the synchrony in brain activation. And finally, shown here on the right, we also looked at how much the children were actually given agency by their mothers. So the, how much they could take the lead and how much they could take charge of the interaction and also tell the mom what to do next. And here we interestingly also found that the more the children were given um, agency, the more they were able to lead, the more brain-to-brain -brain synchrony we observed during this uh, cooperative puzzle solving. The next question then was, and what about dads, right? So how does the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony between dads and their children relate to the behavior? And here, interestingly, we didn't find any correlations between the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony and any of those behaviors and other components that we have observed in mothers. And this again was an indication for us that although both moms and dads, they do synchronize with their kids, this synchrony in the brain actually quite um, likely relates to quite different behaviors and different things that are going on during the interaction. Um, so we, because we didn't find anything for fathers on those other components, we, we um, tried to look a little bit, um, in, well, we tried to look at different things. And what we found was very interesting because we found that the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony in the father-child dyads was higher when the fathers 
reported that for them it's more important to be involved in, in child care activities, that they had a stronger perception of the importance of their role of being a dad. So that's what you can see here in this, in this scatter plot. So the more the fathers indicated that they feel rewarded by, uh, by interacting with the children, by being a father, that being there for children is actually very important for fathers, the stronger was the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. So to conclude, what we found is that both moms and dads show increased brain-to-brain -brain synchrony with their kids when they play puzzles together, when they solve problems together. Um, that we found some interesting differences between moms and dads that merit further research, um, which point to the fact that the same goal might be reached through different means and that it's probably most beneficial for children to have many different interaction partners um, because they can learn more and different social, emotional, cognitive skills. And this also points to the fact that it might actually be important to also dissociate the biological sex of the children, right? Because boys might interact differently with their mom or dad and girls might interact differently with their mom and dad. So that's something we are looking into right now. And something that we need to consider when we see such findings is that of course, this is a playful environment and in this specific context of solving a puzzle, of solving a problem together, it might actually be good to be more strongly in sync. But as I have said before, more synchrony might not actually always be better, right? So if the mother gets stressed or the child gets stressed, then it might actually be better if we see a temporary desynchronization because that is then probably indicative of a good co-regulation. So this is also something that needs to be looked at because most of the studies so far have looked at synchrony in positive contexts, in not so stressful situations. So we need more research on also more stressful situations to really see this dance 